Okay, three, two, one. Hello, world! Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night, wherever you are, I don't know. Uh, it's probably afternoon for some of you, uh, especially from Asia and uh, Australia. But here it's morning, it's a beautiful morning, and it looks like I just woke up. It's not completely true, but uh, yeah, uh, it looks like this is a beautiful uh, stage of my life in which I'm starting to have my my hair white like an old man but i'm also still having pimples like a teenager that's wonderful so today is the 23rd of january 2021 and this is the first day in which we are starting to get uh, um, slow because well uh, we should have been talking about code quality by far but it's not really true as i told you already we are going to spend some time with the fundamentals and then we'll probably speed up uh, in with other slides in fact if you open one of the other slides you will see that uh, they just have a couple of slides here uh, these are this has three slides at all <laughs> overall so don't worry about that we're not going uh, to too slow we're going exactly at the right pace or if I'm going to slow or if I'm going too fast, you can just uh, uh, tell me. Please give me some feedback. Um, I always forget that my name is Anthony and you can call me like that. So please don't call me teacher, sir, sir or something like that because I'm, uh, I'm your brother, okay? <laughs> and um, there are some people that already understood this. In fact, I have beautiful chats with uh, Bobby, for example. Um, and Bobby today, th this week gave me quite a lot of material to work with so thanks a lot bobby because he did the exercise the homework on the gen z application and he gave me something like seven different attempts which is awesome thanks bobby for all this dedication and uh, feel free guys to do exactly the same if you have been doing this exercise and want to share it um, you can share it privately with me on Discord, on Slack, wherever you want. Or you can even share it with the whole class. But keep in mind that you're going to spoil the solution to everybody. Um, or if your solution is not correct, if you have problems with that solution, then maybe you can share the solution with everybody and ask for help. Maybe other people will try to, uh, to fix the problem, to, to, to locate the, the bug somewhere. So, today we're going to start with uh, this Gen Z application, we're going to review the Gen Z application, and then we will start uh, another important part of uh, any programming language, which is conditional operators and logical operators. And then, only then, maybe next lesson, uh, oh well, we can also do a little bit of null coalescing. Yeah, this is a new feature. I never used it, actually. And then this is our real huge boss, loops. But first, let's do the um, homework. So, hi, Tiago. Hi, Angelo. Good to see you. So, the homework that I gave you last Wednesday was Gen Z. Gen Z is an application that asks the user for their year of birth, then outputs true if the user is a Gen Z, and false if the user is not a Gen Z. A Gen Z is anybody born after the year 2000. So, let's have a look first at uh, Bobby's attempts. Or maybe not. No, I will try to do the exercise by myself and then look at Bobby's attempts. Okay, so Gen Z is an application that asks the user for their year of birth. So this is the first thing. I have to ask the user for their year of birth. This is the first thing that I want to do. And uh, then outputs true if the user is a Gen Z and false if the user is not a Gen Z. So outputs true or false depending on the the fact that the user is a gen z or not so um gen z or not i don't know and uh, there's also another thing important which is how do i know if a gen z, if a user is a gen z or not maybe i can first calculate if the user is a gen z or not and then i can output true or false depending on this 
um, results that I obtained. So we said that Gen Z is anybody born after year 2000. Okay, I just rewrote the things that I wrote here, but as you can see, I tried to make it uh, uh, a little more, uh, a little shorter, and also I tried to reorder my thoughts. As you can see, this uh, Gen Z is anybody born after the year 2000, I put it here in the middle, because I think that that's where my, my code will expect to have this, uh, this rule. Not after, but right before. So, ask the user for their year of birth. How do I ask the user for something? I use the prompt function. And the prompt function is accepting a message, such as, uh, what is your year of birth? The prompt function also accepts a second parameter, which can be uh, a default value. So what is the year of birth by default if nobody inputs the year of birth? Well, nothing. You can say I was born in year zero, I was born in year 2000, or you can just say no, there's no valid year if I, didn't, if I don't specify any year of birth. Sal says, good morning, sorry I didn't have time to do this homework. No problem, no problem, we're going to do this together. I hope that I'm not spoiling this uh, homework to you. Um, I'm going really slow on that, so you have the time to do it by yourself while I'm explaining it. So, what, year, what is your year of birth? I think this is fine. And the result of the prompt is the year of birth of the user. So, I can store it in a variable. So, let year of birth, for example just to be as explicit as possible. Let year of birth is equal to the results of prompting the user. What is your year of birth? Then, well, as you may know, year of birth is now a string. So it would be better actually to convert it into a number, especially if I have to do mathematical operations on this variable. So maybe I can also do something like rewriting year of birth by converting it into a number. And we can do it in multiple ways. One of the ways is to wrap it inside of a number function like this. Number year of birth takes the year of birth, whatever type it is, it's actually a string right now, and converts it into a number. Okay, and uh, then we have to see if uh, this guy was a Gen Z. So one person is a Gen Z, if they are born after two, year 2000. And um, maybe we can store this in a variable, such as uh, let is gen z. And let is gen z is a variable that stores the result of comparing the year of birth with 2000. Being born after 2000 means that the year of birth is greater than the number 2000. Because if I was born after 2000, for example, 2005, 2005 is greater than 2000. So I would just say that here, year of birth is greater than 2000. And that's it, because um, year of birth greater than 2000 is a conditional, is, um, how do you say, is a comparison. And comparisons usually return a Boolean value, either true or false. So if this statement is true, is Gen Z will be true. If this statement is false, is Gen Z will be false. And that's the only thing that I need to know, because this is the only thing that I need to output. I have to output either true or false. So now the only thing that I need to do is to output the value of is Gen Z. So I'm going to do it here. How do I output the value of Gen Z? I'm going to use alert because I'm going to work on a browser. And I'm going to just alert is Gen Z. Or if you want to be fancy, you can do this with uh, a template literal, so with backticks. And uh, we can say user is a, a Gen Z colon, and then I interpolate this, va the value of the variable, okay? So user is a Gen Z colon true or false, depends on the outcome of this calculation. Who knows if it will work? Let's have a look. What is your year of birth? Unfortunately, it's 1982. 
Okay, user agency, false. No, I was joking, I'm not born, I was not born in 1982, I was actually born uh, last year. And user agency, true, okay? So, this kind of works, and uh, you see, it looks like really, really simple, it's just four lines of code. But it's simple just because I did it and I'm an experienced experience developer. If you try it by yourself, maybe this is not as easy as it was for me. And it shouldn't be as easy as it was for me. It should actually be quite difficult. And um, let's see how difficult it was for Bobby, for example. I'm not going to show Bobby as a bad example. In fact, I think that Bobby did a great work. And he didn't come up with one solution. He came up with seven different solutions, which is already awesome because he didn't want to stop at the first thing that came into his mind. And I really, really encourage you guys to do exactly the same. I encourage you to never settle, never uh, stop at the first solution that comes into your mind, uh, but try to make it better and to improve constantly until there's nothing more to improve. So let's see Bobby1. One. Uh, Bobby1 one is Bobby's first attempt. And I'm not going to say too much about this because Bobby cheated here. He didn't make mean to cheat. Um, Bobby thought that we already covered conditional statements, which we didn't. We are going to cover them now. So his first attempt uh, involved using these conditional statements. But it's actually cheating. It's like in Blockly games using some blocks that are not yet unlocked in the current level. So we're not going to look at this. The only thing that I want to show you is that, well, he used a default value here, zero, in the prompt, if nobody, if, if the user doesn't uh, type anything. And he parsed the string with parse int instead of with number which is fine, you can do anything, you can uh, transform the string into a number any way you want. I think it's better if you use number, but if you want to use parseint, or if you want to use the plus, as we saw this trick that turns automatically a string into a number, that's fine. So, not going to tell you any more about this, because this uses conditional statements. Bobby2! This is a beautiful attempt, because this looks like um, Bobby didn't have very clear either the requirements or the, the tools that he's using. So he doesn't know ex exactly how it works and he's trying to make it work as much as possible. So as you can see, he started using var as a keyword to declare variables. I already told you that var is an old fashioned way to declare variables. I think that it should not be used anymore, but if you do the exercises on FreeCodeCamp, you will see that they st still speak about var so it's not incorrect to use var. I think it's outdated and I encourage you to use let, but if you use var, that's fine. Just remember what you're doing and, and, uh, and be careful because var could lead to unexpected results in, some, in certain scenarios, not in this case, but in other scenarios that we'll see later, it will lead to unexpected results. So, var a is the result of prompting. Are you Gen Z? Please add your year of birth. I love this welcome message. By default, still zero. Still parsing the, in, uh, the, the string a as an integer. And, uh, and then we've got four other variables. B is the result of uh, comparing a with 2000 and checking if a is less than or equal. 2000. So I would say that the value of B holds the fact that I'm not a Gen Z. C instead is exactly the opposite. It stores the results of comparing A with 2000 and C means somehow uh, is the, the user is a Gen Z. Um, one small note immediately, probably A, B, C, D, E are quite obscure as variable names. And it would be much clearer for me, the reader, but also for the developer who's trying to solve the problem to use different names. Because if you use different names, uh, the code becomes more meaningful to you and you have more control on what you're doing. If you're not doing this, this is what happens. Uh, you have multiple variables which you probably don't remember the meaning and you're starting to add and add even more. var d is equal to a is equal to c uh, 
strictly equals to true. So what does this mean? Uh, no idea actually. Um, this is declaring a new variable called D, which has the same value of redeclaring also the variable A. So A has been reassigned a new value, not not redeclared. Sorry, it's being it was declared already two times here, which is another thing that you you're you're not supposed to do. Just declare the variable once, and then you can assign another value. How many? how many values you want, but don't redeclare the variable. You can say var a is prompt and then a is equal percent. But if you say this, you are trying to redeclare the same variable, which doesn't make any problem uh, right now. But uh, for example, in strict mode, if I use strict, uh, strict mode, which means just uh, using this uh, string, use strict, then I'm probably not going to make it work. Nope, still working. Uh, probably because use strict in here doesn't work. I have to create a, another um, another file and uh, and in, import it here. So, well, okay, let's not worry about this right now. So, var a is prompt. Var a is parsint. We are redeclaring the same variable, which is not good. Maybe we can just reassign a new value to the same variable. And then here we are reassigning again a new value to a. D will hold the same value as A, and the value will be the fact that the statement C is true, or the fact that statement B is false in this other case. And then we alert the value of A. So if I copy all of this code and try to make it work here, are you a Gen Z? Please add your year of birth. Okay, um, let's say it's 2001. Okay, and it says true. So it looks like it's working. And which means that this code is not bad. It's actually fine. It's good. But there's still some room for improvement. In fact, if you try to read this code, even Bobby, I think if he tries to read this code uh, tomorrow or after a week or after a month, he will have to wrap his head around what the, re what the different uh, variables uh, were storing. So one thing that we can do instead is to change the name of these variables. For example, I'm using year or year of birth or let's do year. So this is year. Oops. Year. Year. I'm not. OK. Um, this is year. And this is year. This already makes the code a little more clear because as you can see, I'm checking the year from the user, I'm parsing the year as a number, and B and C store the fact that the year is less than 2000 or is greater than 2000. Now I can even ex make B and C more explicit. So B is, uh, I don't know, not a Gen Z. I can read my monstrosities anywhere, anytime. <laughs> okay. Um, it, uh, is, if this is a challenge, challenge accepted. I will uh, probably show you your same code uh, in, in a few months, not saying that that was your code. And you will say, what is this mess? Um, so this is not a Gen Z. Uh, the variable C, uh, the variable B now is not a Gen Z. And the variable C could be a Gen Z. I don't know. <laughs> I'm messing up with the variable names. But as you can see, it's not a, a perfect science here. So. Now we've got two variables, not a Gen Z and a Gen Z, which mean agency. Nice. <laughs> what a cool uh, pun. Um, which hold the value of not being a Gen Z and being a Gen Z. Now, the fact that D is equal to A is equal to agency is equal to true looks quite strange, looks mysterious. And these two variables, D and E, are not really that important probably. Uh, D is checking if the if agency is equal to true. So we can say is the user really a Gen Z? Okay, probably the value of D is this. And E is not a Gen Z is equal to false. So E could be um, renamed into is the user not a uh, non Gen Z. <laughs> oh, they have the same length too. So 
the, the variables that we had before were something like, I want to check I, if the user is a Gen Z, if the statement is true, or if the fact that the user is not a Gen Z is false, which has the same meaning as saying that the user is a Gen Z, because it's a double negation. If the user is a Gen Z, then of course the user will not be not an engine, a Gen Z. Okay, so these two statements are good and they probably both give me true if the user is a Gen Z. Um, redefining, uh, reassigning a value to A is not really that important because A was the year. So it is quite strange to do this if I rename A into the variable that I, the, the variable name that I found out now, year. So because I'm not want, I don't want to alert the year. I want to alert true or false if the user is a Gen Z or not. So it's pretty strange to assign a value, the, a Boolean value to a variable called year and then print the, the, the year. You can print, is the user really not a Gen Z? This will give you true if the user is a Gen Z. Or you can print, is the user not a Gen Z? Which holds the same value because it's uh, using a double negation. Or if you want, you can even put just a Gen Z, <laughs> which is this variable here making the other variables, all the other variables except the year, completely useless because I just want to check if the year is greater than 2000. If this is true, then I already got my results. I don't, do, I don't need to perform any more calculations, okay? So this was a really, really convoluted example and it's not, of course, the, the attempt uh, that Bobby made. This was just the second attempt that Bobby made. And he tried again and again until he refined his solution. So I'm going to go back. You know what? No, I'm not going to go back. I'm, I'm keeping it like this. Uh, let's go to Bobby3. This was his um, next attempt. Var A is prompt. Are you Gen Z? Please add your age of, year of birth. By default is zero. A is still being parsed. And here we only have one example. A is now redefined, not reassigned, but redefined, which is not good. We should reassign and never redefined. And this is reassigned as this expression here, which is a less than or equal to 2000 is equal to false. So a is less than, equal, less than or equal to 2000 means I'm not a Gen Z. And the fact that this statement is false means that I am a Gen Z. So this is, as always, a double negation. A is holding, was holding the value of the year of birth and now is holding the value of this double negation. I am not, not a Gen Z. And it's going to print the value here. Still fine, but again, if I'm renaming this variable year, um, this goes pretty well here because yes, the year is actually being parsed. And here this, is, this becomes a little strange, becomes a little awkward because uh, I'm not printing the year, I'm printing another value, I'm printing a Boolean value, as always. Um, if you want to be pedantic, if you can even create different variables for this because the year was a year in a string format and now the year is a, a, a number format. So some people even do something like year string and uh, they declare a different variable year, which is the parsint of year string, just to make it even more clear that the year that you get from the prompt is a string and must be parsed. So now we've got the year as a result of parsing the year string. You can even use, use year number, but um, I'm not suggesting you to do this. I'm just saying what people do in their lives. And then we will also reason about I I the, the convenience of uh, of writing code like this. So var year is prompt, year is parsing here, that's fine. I don't really like this thing here because I'm reassigning a new value to the variable year, which has no, um, no connection with the year. This is a Boolean value. So I would say, let's create a new variable here called uh, is Gen Z. And then I'm alerting is Gen Z. I'm, I don't need to spare variables. 
There's no need for that. The computer will optimize the code and will probably remove automatically any extra variables. The variables are useful to you, the developer, not for the computer. And of course, is Gen Z, is this expression? And we already saw that this expression is good. It works. I can try it. Oh, okay, now it works as uh, being already declared for some reason. So I have to refresh the page. It doesn't work with A, but it works with is Gen Z for some reason. Oh, for probably because I use the keyword let. So are you Gen Z 2004? And it is true. If I do the same with the uh, year 1999, it's false. So this code is still working, but this Conditional expression is a little too convoluted. It's, it works, but instead of double negating, we can turn the cards around and have, instead of year less than 2000 is equal to false, we can make it year greater than 2000 is equal to true, which should be exactly the, the same meaning. And as I already told you, uh, year greater than 2000 is equal to true is still a bit redundant. Do you see how it is redundant? If you don't see how it is redundant, let's continue on because this is a one last thing that I asked Bobby to refine in his solutions. But before, oh, okay, this is exactly what, um, uh, what I came up with uh, now. So var gen z is prompt. Are you gen z? Please add year of birth, zero, parse in gen z. Var gen z yes is equal to gen z to th uh, greater than 2000 is equal to true. And finally, alert gen z yes. So what do we have here? We've got a variable called gen z here, which uh, is probably misleading because this variable doesn't hold the fact that the user is a gen z or not. It just holds the year of birth. Also, we've got a strange thing going on here because prompt accepts two parameters, the message and the default value. This third parameter in JavaScript is being ignored completely. In other languages instead, in more in stricter languages such as Java or C Sharp, a function can only accept a, a specific set of parameters and if you add a third parameter which is not uh, recognized it will give you an error but as you know JavaScript is a little more resilient so it's going to not give you an error in here but still it's going to completely ignore, ignore this part which has actually no meaning no meaning you are trying to parse Gen Z as an integer but in this place, Gen Z was not even declared because you declare Gen Z as the result of doing this computation. So first you do this computation and then whatever comes from this computation is stored in the variable Gen Z. So this is not really that good and probably was a, a result of moving things around, copying, pasting, t cutting, etc., etc., which is completely understandable. Probably what he wanted to do is, as always, reassigning a value to Gen Z as the result of parsing Gen Z as an integer. And still, Gen Z is probably not a good name here. Maybe we should call it just year or year of birth. And maybe this Gen Z, yes, could be called Gen Z or is Gen Z or whatever you want. As you can see, this code is now pretty similar to the Bobby 3 that I just uh, refactored. We are doing an activity which is called refactoring. And refactoring means changing the code so it behaves exactly the same as before, but the code becomes more readable, more uh, uh, flexible, more powerful even. Um, Angela says, thanks Bobby and Anthony for going through your attempts, really helps a lot to also see why some approaches do not work slash are not so efficient. Thanks Angelo, I really appreciate your feedback on this and uh, I also appreciate the feedback that you guys gave me today about my announcement. You have no idea how meaningful it is if you just put a reaction or just re reply to my calls because uh, I feel less alone. <laughs> it feels like I'm really interacting with you guys instead of just uh, talking to myself. So really, thanks a lot. And I'm glad that you were uh, appreciating this. If you have other attempts that you want to share 
and uh, pl please do because this is the most important part of all the lessons this is what youtube tutorials are not able to do this is the feedback that i get that i get from you and we reason about multiple different ways to achieve the same result and what is most more convenient what is less convenient there's no good or bad solution the good solution is what something that works the bad solution is something that doesn't work but we can find some better solutions because Code that works, as you know, uh, any, any fool is able to write code that the machine is able to understand, but only a few ones are able to write code that a human can understand. And this is a good occasion for us to try to do this, which is something that experienced developers do not do. A lot of experienced developers out there stop at the first solution and they don't want to refine their solution because of the old saying, if it's not broken, don't fix it. Yes, you should fix it, because if it's not broken, it could still be crap. No worries, mate, errors is what I'm best at even in life. Nah, don't believe you. Memonkey1 says, K-E-K-W. Thanks for the message, I have no idea what you're saying, but I appreciate it. And there's also Magica Ross. You know you're gonna have to add another check because Gen Z ended, right? Also, Gen Z start mid 90 not 2000. Uh, yes, you're right. Um, we we started having uh, we we started using a, a different definition of Gen Z um, because I don't know. I we didn't see any conditional operators other than the comparison operators. So I had to come up with uh, one word. So I bent a little the definition of Gen Z in order to make it work here. But today we're going to, uh, to be stricter. Don't worry, don't worry. Uh, Memonkey1, thanks for the key EKW. Uh, if you tell me what this means, <laughs> it would probably, I would love it. Um, no, no, no idea what this means. Anyway, we are already looking at clean code right now. We are not only learning how to write code, we are already starting to learn how to write good code, clean code. So this is really important. We have to come up with a solution and then we have to think on how to make it better and better and better. And this is what makes us craftsmen, craftswomen, or even artists somehow, sometimes, okay? Okay, so Bobby4, this is a good attempt. It works exactly the same as Bobby3 after my refactor. Let's look at Bobby5, because I was really, really pedantic, and I said, you can even remove more things to, to the current code. Um, Mimonkey1 says, I just thought that what Jabata said was funny. Ha ha ha. Oh, okay, so key E, key W is a, a way to say funny thing. Okay, okay, cool. Um, so, Bobby5 uh, Bobby is the attempt of Bobby, trying to make it even uh, shorter, maybe. Uh, but this actually is probably worse than Bobby4. In fact, uh, parse int is still being kept here and we already saw that this is not good. Maybe we can put it on its own separate line because this is what makes it work. This is not what makes it work. Oh, there's also a, another a very subtle thing happening here. Uh, the parse int is being performed on an undefined variable because before defining the variable we are doing this calculation on a variable that has not been defined yet. So Gen Z will actually be a string. But this code is still working. Why is that? Well, we saw last time that if you do a comparison between a string and a number, especially with a greater than, less than, greater than, greater than or equal, or less than or equal, well, this, this will uh, um, create um, an automatic conversion of one of the two into the type of the other. In this case, it will be a conversion from string to number automatically. You know, of course, this thing, no? You, 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 we already saw what is uh, this automatic type conversion that is being performed in JavaScript. It's a thing that happens in weakly typed languages. So we are not even supposed to do a parse int if we don't want to. This code is still working. But for the sake of being explicit and uh, completely safe, 
we are going to still explicitly convert the string into a number because we already know that for some operators this is going to work the string will be automatically converted into a number but for some other operators such as the plus it's actually exactly the opposite the number will be converted into a string and the plus will be a concatenation between strings not a, um, a sum so just to me to be safe let's always convert our inputs so we are performing operations on the same operator uh, on the same op type of operands so now what i see here is that bobby tried to condense two lines into one he declared a gen z yes variable here without even using the var keyword he's assigning a value to gen z yes and whatever happens here is being alerted Maymonkey1 says, why are you assigning a variable inside the alert function? Yeah, <laughs> good question. I don't know. The, pr the, the fact is that I was, uh, um, I was telling Bobby, hey, there's a solution which is even simpler than, than this one here. And Bobby probably tried to make it shorter. Not simpler, shorter. And uh, he's right. You can achieve the same result with one line of code. I can probably write this code like prompt let's just say year i'm going to convert it into a number i'm going to check if this year is uh, greater than 2000 and all of this i'm going to alert it this is the shortest form of the solution let's find it out let's try it out year 2001 true let's try again year 1995 false okay so the solution could be even as short as this line here but this does not mean that this is a good solution this is not a simple solution this is a short one and it's a uh, not simple at all let's see what uh, other people have to say uh, so we are in 2021 says Tiago if the user puts above 2021 should give an error if we want to be more strict uh, yes, could, this could be another good addition, and we're going to add it today if you want to. Um, yeah, why not? But it's still, we don't have the tools right now to make such complex reasonings for now. So, as I was saying, this is a short version of the solution, but it's not a simple solution. I would like to point to the fact that simple is the opposite of complex, while easy is the opposite of difficult and bear with me it is really really difficult to create simple stuff it's actually really easy to create complex stuff so the difficult part that we are trying to improve now is how to make things simple and it's actually a difficult task Memonkey says, what's the Discord? I like what you're doing here. Thanks a lot, Memonkey. I would love you to join us on Discord and I'm going to share the link immediately. But I don't want, I want the um, expire never. Okay, you understand it here. Awesome. Okay, so let's try to create a simple solution. And this solution is not simple. Why is it not simple? Because it's very, very difficult to read and also very difficult to change. Uh, I don't really know what this 2000 is. I don't know what, uh, I don't know what is this plus here. Maybe I overlook this plus and I don't see it. Actually, if I, if, if I want to make it even shorter, I can even remove the plus because I showed you that in a numerical comparison, whatever is this string here will be still converted into a number. So this is probably the shortest solution, but I don't like it. I prefer a more explicit solution and a solution that is completely readable and intelligible by everyone. So this, the problem that we have in this line is that there's too many things going on at the same time and we really don't understand what is going on. Uh, what is going on is that probably Bobby had this uh, line of code, var gen z yes is equal to blah, blah, blah. And uh, then he has gen z yes here. 
This is, of course, good code. We just split the logic into two lines. If you want to, uh, to condense these two lines together, you can do it. Uh, you can take whatever is saved in the variable Gen Z and place it here. So you don't need this variable Gen Z yes anymore because all the calculations are performed inside the alert before even um, showing the alert. Uh, what Poppy did instead is probably copy too much. He copied all of this without the keyword variable and did this, something like that, which works, but it also has an unexpected result. This is something that I didn't show you before. Easy to make complex, which is why most people use high level languages for coding, says Magic and Ross. Yes, exactly, exactly. Uh, it is really, really easy to make complex stuff, but as software developers, as uh, computer engineers, software engineers, as coders, we want to take a complex problem and provide a simple solution for that complex problem. Because if our solution is as complex or even more complex than the problem, then probably our solution becomes part of the problem instead of being a real solution. The world out there is chaotic and we want to make order out of that chaos our solution will provide order and will 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 do whatever we're, it was supposed to do in an easy in a simple and uh, an accessible way so this thing that bobby did uh, actually had one side effect that uh, is not really very visible and uh, it's not really appreciable right now you can define a variable like uh, let my variable like this and you already know this. This is a variable with the new keyword let. You can even use const, you know this. If you use var, that's fine, even though let has this extra feature that uh, sees if you have defined this variable already and will give you a syntax error, which is a good thing because here, JavaScript is helping you not redefining variables, which is usually something that you don't want to do. Instead, if you use var every time, like my var, which is different from my variable, well, you probably can redefine my var multiple times and it's not going to complain. So one uh, particular thing about var, the var keyword, is that it doesn't have this extra control that prevents you from redefining the same variable. Also, you can define a variable like this without even using the keyword var or let. And this is actually really similar to using the var keyword, but uh, this makes what it's called a global variable. And a global variable is a, a variable that will be able to be accessed from every part of your software, which is usually a bad thing. You want the, your variables to be local. You want them to be controlled in the same spot in which you are using them. If you have a global variable, the global variable is working on, the, on your part of the code, but it will also uh, affect, as a side effect, some other parts of the code that you probably don't want to. This thing about global variables and local variables is really obscure right now, so bear with me, don't worry, we are going to go into detail on this, but that's one of the other reasons why you should probably stop using var uh, forever. <laughs> you should probably use just let and const. Wanna become famous? Buy followers, primes and viewers on uh, click.rabigfollows.com. Thank you, bot B, K, B, B, G, T, X, blah, blah, blah. Uh, you probably already said that last time, uh, but you probably not. Um, no, actually, it's not a virus. It's not a virus. We, we saw it last time because I'm on Linux, so I can click whatever I want without having viruses. It's a website that allows you to buy some uh, click farms, which will get you more fake followers. And um, get my second spam comment, yes. And uh, I really, really discourage you guys, whatever you're doing, if you're uh, influencers on Instagram, etc., don't buy fake followers because it's not worth it. Um, not obscure to me. Okay, cool. <laughs> so Magic Ross, I think you are, uh, you're already a developer probably. 
I think you should mute him, by the way. Mm, you, yeah? Um, okay, I'll... Okay, I see I can time out or ban or delete message or user action, mod, mod user. I'm going to... Whoa, I was going to make him a moderator. No, wait a second. I'm going to, well, ban him or ban it. Reason, spam. Bye, KBBGTX. Really sorry. I think you should know it's self-advertising in a class. Yes, it is self-advertising, but um, since I'm not buying his stuff, it's probably going against uh, th this, uh, this website. Don't buy this thing. Actually, any piece of information is, is, uh, is important and can be used in, a, in an effective way. This was a good occasion for me to say to anyone out there, don't buy this stuff. So it's an advertisement uh, uh, on the opposite side. So let's go back to doing, doing simple stuff. This is not simple because this is quite obscure. Uh, there's no reason to, to declare a new variable. There's no reason to declare a variable this way without even using the, key the keyword var or let, which makes it even more complicated to, to understand. And uh, there's no reason to even perform calculations inside of an alert. It is much better to perform these calculations outside and then alert. This way, every single line is a statement that has a specific meaning. Old school dev with very bad practices. Oh, okay. So if I know if this could benefit you, uh, I hope so. Uh, I'm trying to create a, an academy that uh, could be useful for both beginners that are learning to code and also experienced developers that want to write better code or even more experienced developers that could just benefit from entertainment. This is the sixth attempt from Bobby and it's the second to last. This is close to perfection. Var Gen Z is prompt. Are you Gen Z? Please enter your year of birth. By default it's zero. And then alerts Gen Z greater than 2000 is equal to true. Nothing really bad with this. Probably this zero by default has no real meaning. So we could remove it. And there's also this redundant thing going on here. And uh, I try to give a hint to Bobby about the redundancy of this. If you don't see the redundancy here, let's find, uh, let's see my hint. This is my hint. So let's say that a statement is Gen Z greater than 2000 is equal to true. Now I want to see if the statement is true. So I can declare another variable, is statement true, that checks if the statement is equal to true. Then if you want, I can create another statement is statement really true which is the result of checking if uh, is statement true and checking if it's really true <laughs> as you can see i can make it larger and larger and larger if i have a statement that is true i can always create another comparison which checks if the previous statement is true but on the opposite i can make it uh, simpler by not stating that the statement is true. I don't care if that statement is really true. It was true in the first place. And I don't care if this statement is true if I already know that Gen Z is greater than 2000. So is Gen Z making it this statement here, if I now replace it here, I, I hope that you see that this other sentence that I had here, let statement is Gen Z is equal to true, is actually redundant because Gen Z greater than 2000 is a statement that already gives me either true or false. And there's no need to say that this is also equal to true. Hope that it makes sense. Uh, if it doesn't, it will probably make even more sense uh, when we are doing conditional operators. So don't worry about that. But this is also... Um, a rookie mistake. It's not really a mistake because it works. But uh, yeah, we can say that it's a rookie mistake, um, being a little too too redundant. Uh, you can say also, as always, Gen Z is greater than 2000 is equal to true, or Gen Z is less than or equal to 2000 and equals to false. But it doesn't add anything to the previous statement, to the fact that Gen Z should be greater than 2000. Okay, it's just uh, adding more complexity where where it's not needed. 
And finally, this is the last um, attempt of Bobby. And I said, OK, you're fine. This is great. Var Gen Z is prompt. Are you Gen Z? Please input for your year of birth with no default values because it's not really needed. Var Gen Z, yes, is equal to only the expression Gen Z greater than 2000. He put everything in parentheses, which is not really that important. But why not? You can put it in parentheses if it's more readable for you. So yeah, that's fine. And then Bobby alerts the results of Gen Z, yes. So this is probably the last take. Please input year of birth, 2022, which is a year that is not even in the present, it's in the future. I am a Gen Z, at, at least according to our current definition. But as Tiago was saying, there's prob it's probably stupid say, saying that I was born tomorrow. So maybe we should put some control that say, hey, this date is in the future. You cannot be born in the future. And that's why we could make our code more powerful by using some conditional operators. So finally, we start looking at uh, new stuff. Um, I know I went really, really long with this. We spent 50 minutes looking at this exercise, but I think this was uh, probably even more important than going forward with the program. Okay, so let's go to conditional operators, conditional branching. Uh, this should not be really surprising to you, especially if you played my Blockly games. I said my Blockly games, they are not mine, they were created by someone else. But I showed you these Blockly games at the start of our academy. And with this language, with this visual language called Scratch, you started using some uh, strange blocks which had some things like if path to the left, do turn left or else do something else. Well, we are going to do exactly the same thing, but not with a visual language. We're going to do this in JavaScript with a real programming language that is used nowadays. So the if statement, the if statement is done like this. Look at that. If is the special keyword. Then you add a space usually, which is not needed, but it's better. It improves readability. And then you add a condition inside of a parentheses. And then after this condition in parentheses, you put the statement that should be executed only if this condition is true. If you want to put more than one statement because you want to perform more than one operation um, if a condition is true, then you can say, let's say, wrap all these statements, these two statements inside of curly braces. So you're creating a block. This is the block of the if statement. Magic Ross says, if else, are oh, the best way to make spaghetti code. Yes, you're right. <laughs> you are right, but sometimes you cannot go without if and else. And if you're using uh, um, cool technologies such as Redux, you're probably becoming fond again of the if else and even the switch statement. So yeah, everything is a tool that should be used wisely for the uh, right occasion. So this is what you should do. This is the if statement, nothing more than that. It's an if keyword, then you put a condition inside of parentheses, and the condition, as you can see, is a Boolean condition. It's one of the, uh, con uh, it's one of the comparisons, for example, that we've done so far. And then in curly braces, you put the statements inside of a block. In fact, I can tell you, a good practice could be to always put curly braces, even if you have to put one statement. This if is putting the condition and the resulting statement and the, the statement that will be applied if the condition is true on the same line. This is usually actually a bad practice. You don't want to do that because it's really easy to overlook where the condition stops and where the uh, block uh, starts. So usually when you write an if, let's, um, let's do some um, JS fundamentals, but this was actually lesson 12. So I'm going to create a new folder 12 fundamentals. So I have to do these chores at the, at the start. 
new folder let's call it branching and i'm going to create an ifs js okay so here i can do if in parentheses i can provide a condition whatever condition it is and then i usually open a pair of curly braces and put any statements inside i'm writing pseudocode of course i don't have a variable called condition i don't have a variable called statements i'm writing code that will not work but it's just to 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 make a point if you have only one statement then this is fine you have one statement you do whatever you want you close it with a semicolon if you want to and it can stay inside of curly braces sometimes you see developers not using those curly braces because it works it still works without curly braces if you have one statement but if you have another statement that's where your code is going to be quite obscure it looks like another statement is going to be performed if the condition is true but it's actually not it's a, it's a visual trick made with indentation this code is actually should actually be indented like this if the condition is true do this statement and then whatever happens after perform this other statement if you want these two statements to be performed only if the condition is true then you have to put them both in curly braces even if this thing is indented a little less to make it visually more clear you can indent it a little more but you know that indentation has nothing to do in this language at least with the semantics with the meaning of what you're saying uh, in Python indentation is really important but in JavaScript you can indent things however you want and they will behave exactly the same so the thing that actually changes the behavior is the curly braces if you put all these statements inside of a block of this if statement then this these two statements will be performed only if this condition is true if you remove the curly braces then only this statement will be applied if the condition is true and this other statement is actually being uh, performed only after with no conditions whatsoever this is the reason why usually a good practice is to always put brackets only to put uh, curly braces every time even if you have only one statement in your if condition uh, so you saw in the tutorial here that you can even put everything on the same line you can do this if condition then statement and then you can do another statement this is fine but maybe uh, you could overlook uh, how, what it really truly means so it is much better to put curly braces and it is also much better to put some indentation because this level of indentation is showing you visually what uh, the, the, um, the hierarchy of this condition if a condition is true then do some statement you can put it right there next you see on the right below right on the on the right magic Ross says unless you write old line numbered basic code and have no choice but they have your branching on the same line of your if yes yes in that case well yeah in other languages we can reason about this in Python you have to write statements with no parentheses if condition you have to put a colon and you have to do a statement on a new line and indent it and another statement is like this this is python code python pseudocode but in python you do it like this uh, in python indentation is really important uh, brackets or curly braces or parentheses are not important at all and semicolons are not important at all but that's another language in JavaScript in Java in C C sharp and other mainstream languages that are overall used uh, even in uh, PHP I think you have to use the parentheses you have to use the brackets the, the, the curly braces please use those curly braces wherever you can because this is good code this is not really good code so let's try let's try one of these so let here let, let's copy all of this I'm going to I'm going to write it from scratch uh, where I'm going to write it here so this is going to be commented out 
because it has no meaning. Let year is equal to a prompt of. I'm copying exactly what I see from the tutorial. Let year is equal to prompt. In which year was ECMAScript 2015 specification published? Okay, that's long. In which year was ECMAScript 2005 specification published? Something like that. Uh, almost. ECMA should have been all capital letters and we have to put uh, one uh, empty string by default. We should probably also put a question mark here. As you can see, I'm uh, playing around with being as accurate as possible. I want to copy exactly what I see on the tutorial. I'm doing this as a gain to myself, but also because I want to encourage you guys to be as strict as possible. Programming is like learning a new language, but you cannot make mistakes in this language because those mistakes will probably uh, turn into unexpected results. Um, speaking English is actually uh, much simpler for me, much easier for me, because I can make some mistakes and you can still uh, understand me. But with programming, with JavaScript, you have to be as accurate as possible. Of course, if you are not accurate with writing the string, there's no problem with that, but it's still a good exercise. So let's try to write our first if statement, real if statement. If the year is equal to 2015, then, and this I'm going to do it with curly braces because I want to write good code, not bad code. Alert, you are right. Alert, you are right. So apparently ECMAScript 2015 was published in 2015, quite surprisingly. ECMAScript 2015 is the same as saying ECMAScript 6. Version 6 was what really changed things. Uh, in the JavaScript world because it added so many new features. Well, already ECMAScript 5 standardized the language more. ECMAScript 6 made it uh, a really cool, really important language. So this is how you do conditional statements. If year is 2015, alert, you are right. We can reason a little bit about this code. For example, you know that year is a string. And if I do this comparison, I'm comparing I'm comparing a string with a number. That's why uh, the tutorial is using an equals symbol, not a strictly equals symbol. Because if I use strict comparison, this statement is actually false, because the string 2015 is not the same as the number 2015. So there's some things here that have been left uh, obscured but we can still reason about them. Watch out, because this is doing, this code is doing an uh, implicit type conversion. If I don't want to make it implicit, I can make it a little more explicit, like putting a plus here, the usual trick, or you can do, you can wrap this here into a number, or Bobby's favorite, you can use parse int, whatever you want, and then in that case, you can use strict comparison. I'm going to use my own favorite number year. So we never use just equals in if condition because equals is only for declaration of variables, right? Yes, exactly, Angelo. This is really, really important. And that's why I also put a meme about this. Uh, let's repeat this meme now that you know what an if is. Oh no, the robots are killing us. But why? We never programmed them to do this. Yes, you did. In fact, if you see this if statement here, it says, if is crazy murdering God robot is equal to true, kill humans. Well, this equal with just one equal symbol is an assignment. And the assignment, as you know, well, assigns a new value to the variable is crazy murdering robot and returns whatever value was, uh, uh, was set. So this if actually results into a true. So the robot is going to kill the humans. So this is really, really important. Thanks, Angelo, for pointing that out. You have to make sure that in the if statement, you have at least two equals symbols because equals like this means a comparison. With three equals, you are doing a strict comparison. But if you do this, this is really, really bad because whatever year was put, was input by the user, now you're actually 
reassigning a new value to year. You are forcing the fact that year is 2015. Well, actually not because there's this number here. But if I do this, let's try it. Magic Arrow says, except in basic, where they are always only one equals, but then again, basic is probably the worst language ever. I agree. <laughs> basic is probably... I hope that nobody is writing basic anymore. So, let's try... Let's try everything. Let's try with double equals. So I'm going to copy all this code and uh, putting it in on the developer tools. Oops, identify year has already been declared. Thank you, thank you, let keyword. The let keyword allowed me to uh, avoid this mistake because I declared it, oh, probably not. <laughs> Wait a second, I'm going to redo it again. Okay, no, it was not this, sorry. Um, okay, in which year was ECMAScript 2015 specification published? Let's say 2015. Yes, you are right. And what if uh, I didn't put year 2015? Let's try again. I'm saying 2016. It's not telling me anything. It's telling me undefined. Hmm. This is really bad. We're going to improve on that. But still, this conditional is working. Now, let's try with something else. Let's try with the uh, strict equals here. I assume that this is... Uh, well, yeah, I assume that this is not going to work because the year is a string and a string is not strictly equal to a number. So let's try. Uh, uh, yeah, 2015. Yeah, sure. Nope, undefined. I'm not right. I'm not right because the, strictly e the strict equality is uh, telling me that they are not equal. So, let's try again. I'm using strict equals, but this time I'm also going to do some type conversion. So, with this plus, as you know, this is a hack, but you can transform the string into a number right away with just one character. Magic Ross, you write basic quite a lot. Really? For... Is it for, uh, for what? For, with Excel sprite sheets? I don't know. <laughs> I'm sorry for you, Magic Ross. I hope that you are going to use also other languages. So, let here is, uh, let's convert this prompt into a number. Now we can do strict equality. Let's see what happens. 2015. And now you are right. So, strict equality with the plus symbol or whatever uh, other way to convert the string into a number works. And now let's find, let's try the, the last one. Let's do an equality with just one equals. In which year was uh, it, was it published? Of course, it's 2021. You are right. No, I'm not right. <laughs> Why was I right? Well, because as you can see, the year was the string 2021 because I input this number but then in the if statement what I did was year is 2015 the year was reassigned a new value and the value is 2015 and the result of this assignment as you can see is 2015 so this if contains 2015 2015 is greater than zero and so when you convert a number greater than zero into a boolean, it becomes true. So this results in, if true, you are right. I'm always right, because the year was assigned a value which is different from zero. Quite strange, but don't worry, because there's a whole section in this tutorial about falsy and truthy values, which you probably started understanding last time already, but still. Uh, bear with me. So, this is how you do a conditional statement. Please use always brackets. Please always go on a new line. This way, your code will always be error prone. And here we've got the Boolean conversion that I was uh, trying to tell you right, right now. So, you can put whatever you want in the if condition. But, usually, this, uh, this statement that you put inside of the if condition is... Um, I've, is always converted into a boolean value. That's why we have to think about truthy and falsy value. If you put a zero, a zero is falsy because zero is not 
the boolean false it's a number but if you convert it to boolean then it will be uh, it will be false the empty string as you know is falsy because if you convert the empty string into a boolean it's false null undefined not a number all of these become false so these are considered falsy values all other values are considered truthy because if you convert them into a boolean they give you true so if zero uh, this is falsy so this means that any statement that you put inside of this condition will never be executed because these statements will be executed only if the condition is true and this is not true it's false if one is truthy and the same goes here uh, this is just uh, a way to make it even more explicit here we said year is strictly equal to 2015 we could place the result of this calculation in a in a different variable let's is year correct is year correct is a variable that holds the value of comparing the year to the year 2015 and if uh, the year is correct then I'm going to alert you are right. If the year is not correct, I'm not going to alert anything. You see how just placing an extra variable probably makes the code more readable. I now understand why I'm performing this comparison. I want to check if the user uh, inputs a correct year, the, the right answer. Yeah, we can also call it like that, is right answer. Okay, the, the answer is right only if the year was exactly 2015. And if the answer is right, you know what? I can call it like that, is right. If the answer is right, then I'm going to alert you are right. Okay, see how more readable it is. Magic Ross says he does retro stuff. You do other languages, ASM, wow, low level, C, and also PHP. Okay, we've got another PHP developer in the house. Um, I don't know if you're here. PHP community, stay strong. <laughs> okay, so this is the conditional statement, but as you probably remember for Blockly Games, you can also define what to do if the condition is not true. You're, you don't need to do that, actually. In fact, you can also say, if answer is right, then alert you are right. But you can also type and let answer is wrong. And this will be a result of uh, year is not 2015. You remember the strictly not equals is made with an exclamation mark instead of the first equals. You can do a not equals like this or a strictly not equals with a two with an extra equals. So in this case, you can do two ifs. If the answer is right, you can do that. If the answer is wrong, oops. If the answer is wrong, nope. This works. Let's let me try. New tab. Um, refresh everything. Try again. When was it published? Let's say 2014. Nope. Okay, so now we deal with the two branches, the branch in which I'm right and the branch in which I'm wrong. And this can be performed like this. I have a variable that holds uh, the value that is true. I hold the variable, uh, the, uh, in a variable I hold the, 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 the opposite. And then I do two ifs. But it's really, really long and uh, complicated like this. JavaScript and most programming languages have a more convenient way to write this thing. And it's the else clause in the if statement. So the if statement, as it says here, may contain an optional else block. It executes when the condition is falsy. So in the same exercise as before, you have if year is 2015, you do an alert inside of brackets, as you inside of curly braces, as you can see. Else you alert something else. So this statement will be executed if this condition is not satisfied, if this condition is not true. Magic Ross, here's an example of basic code I did recently. Um, 
Okay, I'm hoping that I'm not distracting too much with other uh, topics, however. So, let's do it one last time. Oh, okay, for Commodore. Okay, this is some uh, other piece of code that you can see written in a completely different language. Uh, there are some ifs. Look at that. If t is equal to 18, then go to 35. As you can see, you can uh, use any language out there, but 99% of the times the language will still have variables, will have ifs, will have else's, etc., etc. I won't say every language, because I think that some languages such as Prolog, uh, logic language, do not have ifs and elses. You can do the same things without ifs and elses, but that's a completely different paradigm and it's also a quite exotic language. It's, it's not really that mainstream. So, now that we know how to use an else, let's try to refactor this code so it uses if and else. But I don't want to... Uh, to remove this code. I'm going to do it uh, here right after. I'm going to copy let year is equal to prompt because this is a common uh, common thing and then I can say uh, well I can use that other variable let answer is right is year is equal to 2015 and now if the answer is right oops then I'm going to alert you are right. This is no difference, no different from what you we already wrote before. The difference is here. We don't need another variable. We don't need another if. We can just append to this if statement an else clause. And the else, as you can see, doesn't need any other parentheses because else means in any other case. I don't need to specify another condition. It's just in any other case. So, else alert, nope. And that's it. With uh, fewer lines of code, you have the same results here. And in this case, yes, the code is shorter, but I think it's also simpler because it's more explicit on what happens. If the answer is right, then you do something. Otherwise, in any other case, you do something else. Here, it's a little more obscure. If the answer is right, do this. If the answer is wrong, do that. Yeah, it's fine, but uh, you can just say otherwise, else. So I'm going to comment out this code. I'm just going to use this one here. And let's try it. In which year was 2015 specification published? Let's do something wrong, 2006. Nope. So, as you can see, the else statement is working as expected. The condition was not satisfied, so I'm not executing this alert, and I'm jumping to this other statement, which is the else clause, and it executes whatever is inside of this else clause. And that's it. But, if you have multiple conditions, you can even create what is called an ill else if or an if else cascade. You are cascading you remember style sheets? It's just like style sheets. You are cascading conditions. Look at this code. I'm getting the year and then I'm saying if the year is less than 2015, I'm saying too early. Else, if the year is greater than 2015, I'm alerting too late. Else, I'm alerting exactly. Is this a new topic other than, L, uh, than the if and the else of before? No, not at all. This is one of those recipes that we commonly used, but uh, the rules are already there. I can write this thing... Well... Um, no, I cannot write this thing. I'm going to create a, a new, new version of that. Let year is equal to... Let's say sim simply give me the year <laughs> this time. Um, let year is equal to give me the year. Now, if the year is less than 2015, then, in brackets, I'm going to say alert too early, just like it says in the, um, in the tutorial. And then I can put an else, as always. The else can contain any statement. We put a statement called alert, but we can put any other statement. We can even put another if. 
And in this case, I can put another if that says if the year is greater than 2015, maybe. What does it say when the year is greater than 2015? Too late. Too late. Else, because any if can have an else, I can put another thing here. I can even put another if the year is equal to 2015. But now, probably I'm shooting too far. Because if the year is not less than 2015, and it's not greater than 2015, well, it probably means that it is equal to 2015. So, putting this other if is quite redundant. I can put it, but uh, this is not good code that I'm writing. I'm going to write bad code, and then I'm going to make it simpler. So, let's say alert your right. And I'm making the usual mistake of uh, using the single quote strings, but also wanting to use the uh, apostrophe here. So I'm going to use the double quotes in order to have a string that works out of the box. So this code is ugly, but it works. Let me see if it works. Uh, sorry, I forgot to put the prompt here. Oops. Okay. Let's try again. Oh, come on. I didn't copy it. Prompt. Okay, give me the year. If I say 2000, uh, let's say 2015, it says, you're right. Oh, because I said 2015. Oh, God, I'm getting distracted. Okay, let's, let's try again. I'm putting something that is greater than 2015. 2016. Too late. Okay, so what is happening here? In the, uh, in the first run, the year was 2015. If the year is 2015, then do this. But the year was not less than 2015. So I'm going in the else block. Now, is the year greater than 2015? No. So I'm not going to execute this alert. And I'm jumping into the else block of this. Then, is the year equal to 2015? Yes. On the first run, I said 2015. So it's going to say, you're right. You see how it's cascading? It's going to stop as soon as a condition is true, but if no condition is true, then it will go to the last condition. In the second run, in fact, I put 2016. So, if year, 2000, if year is less than 2015, no, it was not. 2016 is greater than 2015. So, it didn't execute this statement, it jumped to the else. Now, here, the year was actually greater than 2015, so it alerted too late and didn't do anything else because this if condition was satisfied, so I didn't have to go in the else block. So all of this else block was not executed. Let's do one more run with a value that is less than 2015. So I'm saying 2012, too early. What happened here? year was 2012 the if was already true because 2012 is less than 2015 so the program alerted too early and completely omitted anything else uh, it didn't even run through all this else part didn't care okay but this code is pretty stupid and it's pretty ugly so one thing that we can do is to well, I'm going to do one thing that I told you not to do ever, ever. You can remove the curly braces between an else and an if. Because in this case, uh, inside of the elf, I have only one statement, one block of code. And this statement is an if. So you know that when you have only one block of code, you can omit the curly braces and I'm going to do exactly the same here I'm going to omit the curly braces and this behaves exactly the same as before why am I doing this well because you know because we saw it already on the in the tutorial that if you remove the curly braces you can even put the condition and the resulting statement on the same line so in this case I'm going to put the if on the same line and I can indent everything a little less. This code is a little better nonetheless because this code is not branching um, that far. Uh, it's, it's not indenting too much. When you are indenting your code too much you start 
creating some code that looks a lot like a Hadouken. Look at that. Um, no, now I want a link. Open image, a new tab. Look how... Who was that? Ryu? Not Ken. This is Ryu. Hadouken! You see all these ifs? When you start putting ifs instead of ifs and elses instead of elses, this is what you get. You have a really branched and indented code that looks like Ryu was performing a Hadouken on it, okay? So, one good way to avoid this kind of Hadouken, but this is not the only way, we will see other ways, is to uh, lessen this uh, constraint that I gave you of never uh, avoiding the curly braces. In fact, in this case, it's actually pretty uh, important to omit them in order to improve readability. I can remove the curly braces in here too. So I'm going to remove the curly braces from this else if, and I can put the if right next to the else. This is really important. In fact, in some other languages, you don't even have the else if. You have another keyword called elif, which means exactly the same. You can put elif instead of else space if. But this is not the case with JavaScript. In JavaScript, you have, and in Java, in C Sharp, you have to write else space if space. But as you can see now, the three conditions are all at the same level because logically they are at the same level. If something happens, then you have to do this. If something else happens, you have to do that. If any, anything else happens, you have to do that. One last thing that I can do here is to completely remove this condition because the year is either less than 2015, greater than 2015, or exactly the same of 2015. I don't see any other conditions out there. There's no, nothing else that can happen. So you can even completely remove this if year is equal to 2015 because it's implicit. You can just say else. So this is how I usually write my if else statements. If the year is, to th is less than 2015, alert too early. Else, if year is greater than 2015, alert too late. In any other case, otherwise, else, alert your rights. This is one of those recipes that you have to learn by heart. It's not that difficult, but it's really, really tricky, at, especially for beginners, to not write these if-else statements correctly. Maybe you omit the curly braces. Maybe you omit the parentheses. Maybe you put an equals instead of a double or a triple equals. So it's really, really important that you practice on these recipes on these on this syntax and the different ways to use this syntax really really important okay you know what a hadouken code now is and uh, we know about boolean conversion and this is what we've made so far as you can see the code that is shown on the tutorial is exactly what i came up with uh, at the end I hope that you got the gist of it i didn't want to show you immediately this code but I want to show you that this code is actually the result of knowing the rules that we just learned and applying them in a different way, in a creative way. And then you just learn this recipe by heart and you're going to write this code exactly like this every time. We also have another uh, strange way to do if and else branching and it's the conditional operator. You use a question mark. So look at this code, let access allowed which is a variable that was declared but has no value so far. And then age is the result of prompting the user, how old are you? If the age is 18, then I'm going to assign a value to access allowed, true. Else, I'm going to assign a different value to access allowed, false. And then I'm alerting the value of this access allowed. And this is cool. We can, uh, we can do it on our case. We can do it with the Gen Z, for example. So um, I'm going to say let year of birth is equal to prompt what is your year of birth. And then I'm going to define a new variable, which is is Gen Z. And I don't know the value of this is Gen Z. The value is undefined, 
but I'm going to define it later. Uh, and this answers your question, Tiago. Uh, I think it was Tiago, not really sure about that, uh, of a couple of lessons ago, in which you were saying, is undefined uh, asking for user input? No, not necessarily. Undefined means I have no value right now, but then at a certain point I will do some calculations and in that case I will have a value for this variable. And I can say if the year of birth is greater than 2000, then is Gen Z will be equal to true. So I'm uh, placing a new value to the variable is Gen Z. Else, if I want to use the else statement, I can say that is Gen Z is actually the opposite. Is Gen Z is equal to false. And then I can alert the value of is Gen Z. I'm not telling that I'm not telling you that this code is better than what we've done so far. This is so so easy that uh, we don't we don't even need to um, to use if and else's. Uh, but we can do something stranger. We can say, for example, let message and the message will be your... Uh, oh, come on. It's quite difficult to write and to speak and to have the microphone in front of me, so I'm sorry. Uh, you're a Gen Z. Or uh, here I'm saying you are not. Uh, Gen Z. So as you can see, if I have to write a message here, then the if and else can start to help me. Because I think I couldn't use uh, just the true and false to enter a different message. Here instead, I'm declaring that I want to provide a message to the user. If the year of birth is greater than 2000, the message will be this one, otherwise it will be that one, and then I'm alerting whatever message came up from this block of code. Magic Ross, there's a lot of uh, text here. Uh, what the program I showed you do is reclaiming allocated but unused sectors on a Commodore 64 disk formatted for CP slash M and freeing them for use under basic because CP slash M never used plus sector 17 on the tracks that have more than 17 sectors. So on every Commodore CP slash M disk, there is 86 sector wasted. I have no idea what you're talking about. Well, I, I have some idea of what you're talking about because I know about memory sectors. Uh, but yeah, that's uh, really, really low level stuff. So are you, are you programming rockets or spaceships? That's really cool. But here we are going to deal with high level stuff because we are going to uh, provide all the tools to create uh, applications, web applications, mobile applications, even games or whatever, not going that low level. But it, really interesting. Thanks for sharing. Uh, you can also share your um, your achievements in the Discord channel, uh, in the Discord server, on some of the channels. For example, we've got generals, jobs, docs, lulls. No, just talking to the floppy drive, lol. Oh, okay, that was the f sectors in the floppy drive. Okay, so is I hope that this code is clear. I'm uh, prompting the user. I'm declaring a variable for which I cannot provide a value right away because the value will be provided only under certain conditions. If this condition is true, then I, the value will be this one. Otherwise, the value will be this other one. And then whatever happened in this if else statement, I'm going to alert the value of this variable. This code should probably work. And when I say should probably work, I will I mean should definitely work. What is your year of birth? I was born in 2006, like uh, PNTM's uh, nickname. I don't know if you were born in 2006 PNTM, but you have this on your nickname. So 2006, and it says you're a Gen Z. Are you a Gen Z PNTM? I would love to know it. Okay, so it uh, went into this branch, and the message was valued you're a Gen Z and then it uh, went out of this if-else block, so it alerted your Gen Z. Let's try again with uh, my unfortunate year of birth and says you are not a Gen Z because 
this condition was not true so it didn't go into this statement it went into the else clause so message was now assigned this value here you're not a gen z and it alerted that message but we have another syntax that is able to do exactly what we try to do now we have a variable we don't know the value of the variable right now but the value of this variable will be determined by some condition we can write this with this uh, how's it called conditional operator i usually call it ternary operator okay it's called here ternary operator it's uh, no i would be lying if i say i was born in 2006 okay you're not born in 2006 you're just the 26th PNTM on uh, Discord, on, uh, on, uh, on Twitch, probably. I don't know. What's, what's the 2006 uh, stand for, if you, if, if you want to, to disclose this information? Just to get to know you a little better. I just know that you are a boy and you come from Indonesia. That's all, that's all I know about you. Um, boy, man. I don't know. By the way, I'm certainly not a Gen Z, Magical Ross. Uh, <laughs> I expected that. <laughs> I expected that. If you know about uh, Commodores and, uh, and low-level stuff like that and basic, you are definitely not a Gen Z. Um, so I'm going to tell you about the ternary operator right now. The ternary operator, I call it like that because it is applied to three operands. The unary operator is applied to one operand, like uh, plus num or minus num, which makes the number negative. The binary operator, such as uh, num1 plus num2, is applied to two operands. Now we are going to look at a ternary operator, which will be applied to three operands. And this ternary operator, you were in 1975, so you're a little older than me, Magical Ross. Cool age. You could probably see the, the eagles performing live, maybe. Um, so, this ternary operator does exactly what you would want to do in this statement here. You declare a variable and you assign a different value to this variable uh, depending on some condition. If the condition is true, then you are assigning one value. If the condition is false, you are assigning another value. How do you do that? Let me... Again, do this let year of birth. I don't want to, let's do it like this. And now I'm going to say let message is equal to. Now I'm going to write the ternary operator. The ternary operator is done like this. You state the condition with no parentheses. Then you put a question mark. So is this condition true? Then you do a statement. You, do, you define a statement if the condition is true. And then you use a column to separate the statement that will be performed if the condition is true from the statement if the condition is false. This is the ternary operator in pseudocode. So if the condition is true, you will perform this statement. Otherwise, the condition is false, you will perform this other statement. Okay, let's apply it to our case. The condition is year of birth is greater than 2000. So I'm going to put it here, year of birth greater than 2000. This is the condition. The statement in the case that condition is true is this one. Message is you're a Gen Z. Actually, I just need to put the value. This trace statement is, is returning a string and the string is you're a Gen Z. So this will be stored as the value of the message variable. And the same goes with the other statement. I can put this here. And finally, we got it. This is the ternary operator. As you can see, you can put in one line all of this code. But beware, this statement only applies and it's only useful for this specific situation. Not any conditional statement. Only those conditional statements in which you want to assign a value to a variable if a condition is true or if the condition is false. If you have multiple choices like this one, you can use the ternary operator, but you will see it's not really that, that good. Uh, I, will, I will show you, of course. So, year of birth is prompt. Let message is blah, blah, blah. Alert the message. Let's, find, let's try it. I'm going to copy this code here. 
What is your year of birth? 1982. You're not a Gen Z. And neither is Magica Ross, because bo being born in 1975 means that he's definitely not a Gen Z. Uh, you're a Gen X, probably, uh, from the standard definition. Let's do not PNTM, but PNTM's nickname. 2006, you are a Gen Z, if you have this nickname, <laughs> okay? Okay, so this is the ternary operator. The ternary operator uh, is a convenient way to place in one line of code all of this code here. Uh, one line or even two lines because you can indent it and as much as you want. For example, you can put it like this. Uh, I see some people indenting it like this. Let message is equal to year of birth. This is the condition. Year of birth greater than 2000. And then on a separate line, uh, with this question mark uh, in front, this is the statement in case the condition is true. And then on a new line, the statement if the condition is false. This is another cool way to write it. Um, it's still less verbose than this one here. Why is the console in Chrome giving out undefined as the type of the result? Angelo, you are the, the best person in uh, asking questions. Thanks for the question. Uh, because Everything you write on the console is a statement that will give you some result. For example, if I say one, this is a JavaScript statement that will return the value one. If you say two plus three, this is a statement that gives you the result five. And there are some statements, however, that do not return anything. For example, alerts, is one of those statements in which, yeah, something happens, but the result of executing this statement is undefined. And probably also let var variable is equal to five is going to give you undefined. But if I say variable, this statement is returning something. It's returning the value of this variable. Uh, so as you can see, there are some statements that do return a value, and there are some statements that do not return a value. They just perform some operation as a side effect, we can say, but they are not returning any value. And this is a really, really important thing. PNTM says, probably the alert command was not given in the end. Um, no, well, the alert command is being given in the end, but as you can see from this code, the result of all this code is undefined because let year of birth is going to prompt, but it's not going to result in anything. It's just having the side effect of uh, uh, storing the value of the prompt inside of this variable. Let message is another assignment. It's a declaration and an assignment. And as you can see, it's not returning anything. And alert is not returning anything. So all of this code is executing, is performing operations, but it's not returning anything. Uh, this thing of returning things and not returning things will be even more clear when we're going to talk about functions. So don't worry about that and we will go back to it. But um, yeah, this is a really, really good point. Some statements are returning something, start, some statements are not. And that's why this is working. This statement, this, the string, you're a Gen Z, is actually a statement, a statement that executes code and the code just returns the same string as it is. This is important because you, uh, you can, uh, for example, do some calculations. You are uh, here, I'm uh, concatenating two strings. And what is the result of this concatenation? The new string. But if I'm uh, putting the result of this concatenation in a variable, then this is a valid statement, but it's not returning anything. It's doing something. In fact, it populated the result with some value, but uh, the end, the result of this statement was actually undefined. So here, they, this is a really stupid statement because I'm just declaring a string and it's being returned. And the same goes with this one. And this is why this ternary operator is working. You know what? I'm going to document it a little bit. This is the ternary operator, or as, it uh, as it's been called here, it's the conditional operator question mark. 
or conditional operator question mark. I usually call it just ternary operator also because in JavaScript, but also in other languages, this is the only ternary operator that we know about. So uh, we could have multiple ternary operators, but this is the only one. In other languages, yeah, we have some other ternary operators, but they usually behave exactly the same. Um, this is an if else. Um, I don't know, I can say that this is a possible use of an if else, which is um, assigning a value conditionally. Ooh, strange terms, but they do make sense. And this thing of assigning a value conditionally can be performed easily with a ternary operator. Let's have a look at this example again. This is an if else cascade, if else cascade. Let's reread it again. Uh, I'm asking for the year and then I'm saying if the year is less than 2015, I'm going to alert too early. Otherwise, if the year is, 2015, is greater than 2015, I'm doing another thing. In any other situation, in any other case, I'm going to alert you are right. This, we can change it a little bit and make it look a little more like this. So I'm going to copy it here and I'm going to do something similar. I'm going to say that I want to declare a message and this message has no value at first. But if the year is 2015, I'm saying that the message is too early. And if the year is greater than 2015, then the message is too late. And in any other case, the message is your right. What can I do with this message now? I can alert the message. Ooh, not liared, alert the message. As you can see, this code looks really, really similar to the code that we saw before, but it has one small advantage. The advantage is that here I'm writing the same function alert three times. And one day I want to say, I don't want to alert anymore. I want to do a console log of the message. So I have to change the alert into console log three different times. That's boring. And that's also error prone because I could forget one of these changes. It could be just two console logs and one alert. Instead, with this new code that I wrote, I'm uh, somehow pulling the strings of this alert and I'm calling it just once at the end. And in this case, it's really, really easy to switch from alert to console log because I have to change it only once. So as you can see, my refactor consisted in uh, creating an extra variable and creating this extra variable allowed me to move some piece of logic outside of the if else uh, um, cascade, sorry. And uh, this way, my code is, well, some, sometimes it can be considered easier, but it's also more flexible. It's more powerful because now I removed a little bit of copy and paste because I didn't have to repeat alert three different times, but just once. And now if I want to change from alert to console log, I can do it just in one place instead of in three different places inside of my code. You can say, yeah, but this is still copy and paste because you copied and paste message equals message equals message equals, and you would be completely right. I didn't completely remove the copy and paste. I just moved a bit of logic outside of this if else, uh, avoiding the copy, and the copy and paste of this thing here. It's already a something, it's something. Um, what happens if we use the ternary operator? Can we use the ternary operator here? The ternary operator is exactly the same as declaring a variable with a conditional logic. If the condition is true, then I'll give you something. Otherwise, I'll give you something else. Well, in this case, we can do something similar. We can say, uh, okay, given the let here is equal to plus prompt, I can say let message is equal to Oops, let message is equal to. First condition, year is less than 2015. Year is less than 2015. In that case, question mark. I'm gonna put the question mark on a new line. I think it's uh, more clear here, like this. Then the message will be too early. I don't need to put all this. I don't need to say message is equal to too early 
because messages equal to was already stated here. So here I'm just going to return whatever value I want to assign to the variable, okay? So if the year is less than 2015, then the message will be too early. Otherwise, well, this gets tricky. Otherwise, I don't have just one another value. I have another if else statement to provide. So that's why here I can, well, I can add a couple of parentheses if I want to make it more clear for now. I can put another ternary operator. And the ternary operator is, as always, condition, question mark, uh, statement if the condition is true, statement if the condition is false. So I can put this other condition here, year is greater than 2015, question mark. Then I'm going to put this value as a statement for the true case. And with another, semi, um, with another column, I'm going to put the value as a statement for the else condition. And this works. It's crap, but it's, it works. Let me try it. Give me the year. So let's do the 2015, so the last statement. And it didn't work because I forgot to put the alert at the end. Uh, of course, I, I uh, calculated the message. The message is fine and I can inspect the value of the message, but I didn't alert it. You know what? It's actually better because I don't like the alert. Maybe we can just inspect the value of the message on the console. Um, so if since I input the 2015 number, then message was valued like this. Year is less than 2015? No. So I'm not going to too early. I'm going to the second statement. But the second statement is another ternary operator. Is year greater than 2015? No, it was exactly 2015. So I'm going to skip the statement in the true condition and I'm going to the else statement. So that's why message is now your right. I'm going to try again with, uh, another, with another value. Give me the year 2016, because I don't have any more fantasy. Okay, what is the value of the message now? Too late. Why? Because message was valued with this condition. This condition is not true, so I'm not going to too early. So I'm going to the else part of this block. And year is greater than 2015? Yes, it is. So it's going to assign the value too late to the message and skipping all the rest. So as you can see, it's a cascade, uh, just like before. It is a cascade. It's just another way to write the same cascade. And it's a cascade because it flows into the cascade until I reach some condition that stops me. So this is a really bad way to write um, ternary operators. Uh, it can become even more confusing if you drop the parentheses. This is even fine. And um, Magic Ross says, I don't know why, but plus for concatenating strings, somehow that hurt me. I believe you. It's uh, pretty strange too. In fact, in other programming languages such as PHP, you use a dot, I think. You concatenate my dot string, something like that, if I remember correctly. Uh, yeah, any language has their own syntax. But the cool thing is that any language is using the same exact principles. Oh, you're using strucats. Okay, that's a, a function. We never covered function uh, so far. Uh, so every language has their own s s dialect, but the language is pretty always the same. The principles are always the same. You can have some declinations, but the basics that I'm teaching you can be reused in every other language. So this is the ternary operator. Pretty difficult to read so that's why I'm not saying that with a complex if-else cascades, you should use the ternary operator. In fact, I, the, the bottom line of this is I'm discouraging you guys to use the ternary operator for anything that is more complex than just one short assignment with an if-else condition. Just use the ternary operator in this case, if you really want to use it. Otherwise, don't use the ternary operator, just use an if-else cascade, okay? 
And this is what I had to say about the conditional operator. Uh, let result is given a condition. If the condition is true, go to value one. Otherwise, go to value two. I don't think that value is a good name here because, yeah, it looks like you can just put a value. But instead, you can put a statement. You can put some operations. For example, let result is equal to if some operation is equal to sum, then do number one plus number two, provided that I already declared these operation num1 and num2 um, variables. Otherwise, it will be num1, I don't know, minus num2. Okay, let's make this code really work. I'm going to put it here. So I have to define the numbers. Let num1 is equal to you know what? I'm going to ask the user. Give me num1. And I'm going to say the same for num2. So, give me num2. And um, I'm going to put a plus in order to make these uh, numbers. I don't like this, but uh, it's really, really uh, easier for me to, to do it like this. And then I can also ask the operation to the user. Let operation is prompt. Give me operation. And by default, it will be some. So it's less error prone. So this should be working. We are start. I'm sorry. We are starting to create our first calculator. Uh, a calculator between two numbers in which we ask one number another number, the operation. If the operation is a sum, the result will be the sum of the two numbers, and I can also uh, print the result by alerting it. And if the operation is not a sum, it will be just a subtraction for some reason, okay? It's not really that logical as a, as a program, but it's a program that should be working. Let's see. Num1, 3. Num2, Five, operation, let's start with sum. Eight, yes, this is the sum. Could we just go a tiny bit slower so I can follow with copying the code? Yes, of course, Angelo, I'm sorry. Of course we can. And in the meantime, MagicaDOS also showed us another bit of code in another programming language. It says, let a dollar is equal to world as a string. And then I think that's a colon, print hello, and then a semicolon, a dollar, and this is basic. Okay, <laughs> the basic language is pretty obscure. It was supposed to be a language for uh, uh, a very readable language. In, that's why it's called basic, but it's not. <laughs> it's not at all. It's in fact a very old language and old languages uh, were still pretty low level and uh, doing strange stuff. So, yeah. Okay. So what do we have here? I wrote really, really fast uh, because, yeah, sometimes I want to prove a point and uh, write the code as I'm explaining. But this is not always your cup of tea, guys. And I understand it. I'm always, people always complain about this. And you're completely right. Uh, I have to give you the time to either listen to me and understand what I'm saying or write the code. So, yeah, this is a good moment to slow down and uh, reason a little bit about the code while you are copying. So I'm asking for the user for the first number with the usual let num1 is equal to plus prompt give me number one. Let number two is equal to the same thing, but I'm asking for number two and storing it in a second variable. Let operation, now I'm not putting a plus in here because the operation will be a string. It will give me the kind of operation that I want to perform. So give me operation. And by default, I'm putting some. So in this case, it will just work. Uh, and the result is a ternary operator, as you can see. And it's a ternary operator on one line. I can put it on multiple lines if I want to. But for such simple cases, I can place it like this. Uh, probably putting it into a different lines, it's, it's better because it's really difficult to, to look at these operations and uh, make sense of them. You have to mentally divide this operation here from this operation here. Uh, but still, it, it kind of works here like this too. And, uh, and then I'm just alerting whatever results. 
Uh, I like Angelo's feedback because now I also know that at least some of you are trying to write the code together with me. I didn't know it because I don't see you. So this feedback from Angelo is a really, really important hint for me. Thanks, Angelo, as always. Okay, so let's copy this code. Uh, oh, actually, I already done it. So I'm going to just uh, try again with some other value that is not the sum. So give me num1, three as before. Give me num2, five as before. But the operation now is whatever. Okay, the result is minus two. Why? Whatever is not a valid uh, operation. Yeah, but in my code, I said that if the operation is sum, then I'm going to do uh, a sum. And in any other case, I'm not doing a sum. I'm doing a subtraction. We, so I could, uh, I, I could write whatever, uh, subtraction, multiplication, division, whatever, and it's still going to do a subtraction. Now you have all the tools, if you want, to create a real, well, realistic calculator that performs multiple operations. In fact, the homework that I'm going to give you a <laughs> hundred words per minute. Uh, the man types at a hundred words per minute, even with those alien codes. <laughs> sorry, guys. Sorry, guys. Uh, so let num is equal to prompt. Give me num one. Okay, you. If I do this, doesn't do the sum. Oh, thanks, thanks, sum, um, thanks, so. Let me check. Let me check. Let's expect Sao's code. Sao's code. Okay, uh, the new lines where um oh wait a second i forgot the l the new lines were removed in the chat so i'm going to add them myself Ooh, i like it oops i like this code okay i think i put all the the necessary new lines do you see what the problem is in this code guys you know what? You can think about it during the coffee break because it's 12.01 my time, 11.01 UTC, and we're doing the usual five minutes coffee break. So have a nice coffee and see you in five minutes. Bye, guys.
a few moments later. Here I am, exactly five minutes later. So I see that Sao already found her solution and it's uh, totally correct. So the problem is here on line 88 and 89. If you do number of num1, number, sorry, number of num1, whatever num1 is, let's say that it's a string, for example, 45, this will return a number. But this number is not stored anywhere. It's just returned to you on the console. In order to make this change permanent, you want the new value of num1 to be equal to this operation. So what Sao did was, to fix the problem, was doing this. So she reassigns the value. Uh, of, she reassigns a new value to num1 with the result of this operation. And this should totally work. So awesome. Good, 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 good call, uh, Sao. <laughs> Sometimes my my English drifts away. Okay, um, what were we doing? Uh, we were looking at this code and we found out the solution. I hope that uh, somebody else got it. Other than that, what were we doing? Oh yeah, the, the calculator. So, <laughs> of course. So, um, now that we know how to do this uh, ternary operator and uh, that we know how to do conditional uh, branching with if-else cascades, uh, you can probably try to do your own calculator. So this is the homework that I'm going to ask you for, uh, I don't know if next Saturday or not next Wednesday. <clears throat> I'm, going, I'm going to call it calculator. Calculator is a web app that asks for two numbers and um, performs a specific operation on them. Returning, I don't know, that's it. You, you already know what I'm talking about. So the available operations are sum, subtraction, um, multiplication, division, and let's go with, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm going on a new line. These are much better than like this. Sum, subtraction, somebody once told me the world is gonna roll me i ain't the sharpest to in the shed so some subtraction multiplication division i would like to see also the the power if you want to be fancy also the remainder all the mathematical operations that we saw all the binary uh operations that we can do and uh you know Whatever you, whatever you can find. PNTM says, probably for next Saturday day, since there will be minimal participant on Wednesday. Of course, we can talk about it on Wednesday. Uh, no, but I'm pretty sure... Uh, yeah, I think you're right. I think you're right. Usually I do... I, I ask for a, a big exercise that we see on Saturday, so we can correct it on Saturday. Um, on, next Wednesday, we will still do, do what we've done last Wednesday. So just the exercises and the tasks that we see on the tutorials. So thanks, PNTM. Yeah, you're completely right. So these are the operations that we can do, all the operations that you want. I, I want you to be as creative as possible, of course. And the calculator can be created in multiple ways. You can use ternary operators, but you will probably see that it's really, really hard to write them like this. You can use the if-else cascade, which is probably the preferred way. So you can use an if-else cascade or the ternary operator not suggested, okay? And you could also use another, another uh, syntax uh, piece that I haven't explained yet and I will explain it after probably I don't know prob I, I think I will I want to explain I don't know I can explain it even now uh, I don't know why but this tutorial is explaining it after loops but I think that's too much 
So probably I could uh, start explaining them right now. Anyway, uh, let's see what they say. So as you can see, uh, we use the ternary operator. We, we can have multiple ternary operators combined. And as you can see, however, it's really, really difficult to, to read it. Uh, they tried this kind of indentation here. So condition, true statement, and then condition, true statement in every other line. So age less than three, hi baby, otherwise. Age less than 18, hello, otherwise. Age less than 100, greetings. Otherwise, what an unusual age. Nice, but probably an if else um, cascade is much, much better, much more readable. Um, this has exactly the same meaning as doing this if else cascade. And one thing that I really encourage you to do is whenever you write some code with if and else's, try to switch to ternary operator back and forth in order to, you know, get a grasp on these concepts and the syntax. It's really, really easy to make mistakes. Sao made a really interesting mistake, really important mistake. Uh, and as you know, I am fond of mistakes. I, I praise you for your mistakes. So writing your code by yourself leads you to do this kind of mistake. And this kind of mistakes leads you to find a solution, understand why this is a mistake. And probably this will make you um, learn things uh, faster, better, deeper. So I really, really encourage you to do the practice and perform mistakes. But, oh, are you still there? Uh, my computer froze for a while. Still there? Not there anymore? Anybody? Yes, okay, okay, thanks. <laughs> okay, it froze for a while. It didn't respond to my to, to my mouse or to my keyboard events. Okay, non-traditional use of the question mark. Yes, lucked a bit, but better now. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Uh, sometimes the question mark is used as a replacement for if. So as you can see, let company is a prompt of which company created JavaScript. And uh, you can see here, company is equal to Netscape alert right, otherwise alert wrong. This is a code that works. We can uh, try it. Buffered for a bit, yes. Okay, okay. Uh, it's probably a problem with my computer for, for some reason. So which company created JavaScript? I'm going to say Microsoft. So, you bet. And it says wrong. So what is this? This is a ternary operator, which uses the fact that it's still going to execute a statement if this condition is true and another statement if this condition is uh, false. But it is used in a strange, we can say in an improper way because the ternary operator usually returns something and that's something you want to do something with it. Uh, you want to, for example, store the result in a variable just like we did here. You want to have result is equal to ternary operator. In this case, they are using the ternary operator in a non-traditional, unusual way. They are using the ternary operator just to avoid using an if. But if you're not using the result of these statements for anything, then it's probably much better to just use the if else. Um, the word that I was looking for is recommended, not suggested. I'm sorry, my English sometimes jumps. Not recommended, not not suggested. Okay, so if you want to use the ternary operator in an unusual way, don't. Just use an if-else cascade, an if-else statement. Um, there are some people out there that use the language in a very strange and unusual way, but every time you do it, it's less readable, it's uh, less simple, and it's less flexible. So you don't want to write bad code. You have to recognize bad code and maybe refactor it if you're allowed to, uh, if uh, the other person is not jealous of that code, and you, you should refactor it and make it better, read, more readable. And that's it for conditional branching. We, I want to add one thing more to this, 
which is logical operators. Because we already talked about Boolean values, which can be either true or false, and they don't seem to be really interesting or really powerful, but they are. In fact, I already told you that programming is mostly not really maths, it depends if you're doing data science or if you're creating games or uh, in other, in some fields, in physical simulations or whatever, you are using some maths because maths are part of the domain of interest, are part of the problem that you are trying to solve and are the tools that you can use to solve those problems. But for many other kinds of problems out there, you don't need to be a math wizard. You just need to think logically. And that's why Boolean logic, Boolean algebra, is pretty important. It's a very simple algebra. It's not an algebra, uh, it's, it's not as complicated as doing, uh, I don't know, derivatives or integrals or uh, whatever. It's a pretty standard and basic algebra that is, I think, easy to grasp. Or and not, says Magic Ross. Uh, or, oh, sorry, or, and, and not. Exactly, these three here, or, and, and not. And you can do a lot of things with them. So let's have a look at how it works. These guys usually operate on Boolean values. So you know that the values can be either true or false. There's no other value available. The or, oh, the real question is, is math related to science? Hmm, good question. Uh, I would say my take is that uh, science looks like a particular case of math. Math looks like a language invented by yourselves that describes really well the world, but it doesn't describe it exactly. Whenever you see some math formula for, to describe uh, uh, the, the world out there, it is always just an approximation of what is out there. So math, I don't think that the world speaks in maths. I think that we invented math as a really powerful and complex language, which is m more, much more powerful than uh, my Italian, your English or your Indonesian, because it's more uh, precise. It conveys the message in a more efficient way, but it's still going to approximate the world out there. If I say that that flower is a rose, I'm just uh, categorizing something that is much more complex than a rose. That is not a rose. That is a special kind of rose. And it's comprised of uh, different petals. And other roses are have not the same amount of petals or are, do not have the same shape. So, yeah, I think that uh, math is strictly related to science. And math is more generic than science. In fact, if you use the language, you can, uh, you can start thinking of things that do not even exist. In the, in the world, and science sometimes fits as a subset of what you can achieve with maths. But let's not digress too much. This is my personal take. If you have other takes, this is a wonderful uh, topic of discussion, and I would love to hear from you on the Discord channel, maybe outside of the lesson, because otherwise we're not going to go forward. But uh, I would love to discuss about these things. I love uh, dealing with philosophical matters. So please, please, give me food for thought. Okay, the OR operator. The OR operator is represented as two pipes. You know how to do the pipe symbol on your keyboard, I hope. You have to put two of them because one pipe has a completely different meaning. It's one of those bitwise operators that I wanted to skip because you don't care about bitwise operators unless you're doing very low level stuff, just like Magic Ross is doing. Uh, but other than that, you want two pipes in order to do the logic. And the OR is exactly like the human OR. It's either this or that. But there's a catch on this. Usually the OR that we think about is, uh, we call it mutually exclusive. So it's either one thing or it's the other thing, but it cannot be both things together. It's either... It's, uh, the, 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 the sun is either up or it's down. It cannot be both up and down at the same time. Well, there is another kind of or, however, and if you studied Latin, you probably know that in Latin we have a word called vel. Vel stands for a non-exclusively... Uh, uh, how do you say that? Um, a non-exclusive or. 
So a non-mutually exclusive or. So it can be either, uh, the, the sun can be either up or it can be down or it can be both of them. I don't care. The important thing is that it is either up or down. And uh, this translates into this, um, uh, this table. It, you can see it as a table and uh, I'm going to show it as a table. Let's have a look at um, this is another another topic which I'm going to call Boolean operators. Is it called Boolean operators? No, logical operators. Sorry, logical operators. And uh, I have to put it in twelve fundamentals. Sorry, guys. Okay, I'm here. Okay, cool. So, new file. I'm going to say truth table. What is a truth table? A truth table is just a convenient way to show on a table the different values of things. So, if you have a statement, uh, let's, let's build a table. If you have a statement A and a statement B, you can have another column in the table that shows what is the result of A or B. And I realize now, only now, that using the pipes in order to show you, the, the, to, to, to differentiate the, 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 the columns is not uh, a good move. So let's just put uh, spaces, okay? I'm gonna put some spaces. So we've got a column A, we've got a column B, and a column A or B. What can I do with this? Well, the value A could be true and the value B could be also true. What is the resulting value of A or B? We will see it later. We have other um, conditions. For example, A could be true, but B could be false. And A could be false and B could be true. And A could be false and B could be false. These are all the possible combinations that I can have on these two statements. Let's say that, I don't know, A is I'm happy, B means uh, I'm sitting. Then both statements are true because I'm both happy and sitting. Now, if I'm browsing 9gag, I will probably be not happy anymore. So I, A will be false, but I'm still sitting. Instead, if I'm happy and I stand up, then I'm happy, but I'm not sitting. So this is the condition. And if I'm browsing 9gag while standing up, I'm not happy and I'm not sitting, okay? We have all the different combinations of situations that we can have. So the OR operator puts those two statements in an OR. And uh, if uh, A is true and B is false, A or B is true because one of the two is true. Is If A is false and B is true, then A or B is also true, because one of the two is true. Uh, one of the two is true. If none of them is true, if I'm not sitting and I'm not happy, then the statement I'm sitting or I'm happy is false, because I don't have any of them. And I think that this is pretty straightforward so far, hopefully. If one of these are true, then it's true, says Magical Ross. Exactly. So what we are used to usually when we deal with the with or in our, uh, in our ordinary speaking, uh, it's either one or the other. It's mutually exclusive. So if both are true, we usually say that A or B is false in our, in our uh, world. But... As I was saying with Latin vel or in just Boolean algebra, if both are true, the statement is true. So I just need at least one of the two to be true to make the or statement become true. So this is the truth table of the or. And you see, you can place these two like this. How can I use this? I'm going to use it right away, okay? So you, you don't see it as just a... Um, fuzzy thing that has no application whatsoever. Let's go back to the exercise on ECMAScript. So I'm going to call it, uh, no, I'm going to call it ORJS. So 
I'm going to write slowly. Let's year is equal to prompt. I'm asking once again, when was the ECMAScript 2015 standard published? And I'm going to write a string here. Uh, I'm going to say guess the year. I don't want to type everything. Okay? Guessing the year. To make it, mm, to make it work, I'm doing SAO's code. So I'm going to say that year now is converting the year into a number. This is explicit. This is fine. Uh, it's probably much better than just putting a plus in, pro in front of a prompt. This is things you know. Now, I can uh, decide that I just want to see if... Um, well, then the, the, this statement, this is pretty stupid, but... Uh, um, you know what? No, I'm going to go with the, the year of birth. I'm going to go with the year of birth. And I want to, um, to go with, uh, with uh, Tiago's suggestion. Tiago was saying, hey, but if I say that I was born in the future, that's kind of stupid. And I want to say, hey, this date is invalid. How can I say that the date is invalid because it's in the future? I can use an if statement. So if the year is greater than the current year, it's not possible because, well, I cannot be born in the future. Who knows? Um, okay, so if year is greater than 2021, then I want to do something. For example, I want to alert the user, hey, this year is invalid. Uh, year is invalid. Hmm? Otherwise, else, I could uh, do all the calculations. I could see if you're a Gen Z or I can just say that's a good year. Not advertising any entire company. Just a one good year. Okay. But the year is invalid not only if I was born in the future. It could be invalid if only also if I was born way too far back in time. Um, I'm pretty sure that I couldn't be born in 1800 because I should be pretty dead by now. So let's find out a year... The, 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 I don't know, the, the farthest year. What's the oldest person? Oldest person in the world alive. She was born in 1903. Kane Tanaka. Kane Tanaka. Don't know. She was born in Japan in 1903. And she's the oldest person living currently. So anyone before 1903 is probably immortal or just not discovered uh, around the world. So, unless you're a time traveler, exactly. <laughs> so, this is a good way to say that the year is invalid. The year is invalid if the year is greater than 2021, because I'm in the future, or if the year is less than 1903, because it means that I'm older than Kan Kanetanaka. But if you run that code in the future, yes, if I run the code in the future, it's uh, not going to work. That's why later on we're going to change the code so it will work also in the future. But for now we can just stick with the tools that we have. So I could say else if I'm putting another oh sorry I'm putting another clause in here to to state that I'm living in the past not in the future. I can say if year is less than 1903 in the condition and here, well, actually, here I want to alert exactly the same thing. The year is invalid. So, okay, for now, I will say it. Alert. No, oh, come on. Year is invalid. I don't like this code because this code has two lines which are exactly the same. And when I see duplication of code, duplication of code is one thing that we software engineers usually call Code, code smell. It doesn't stink, but it has a strange smell. It's not bad, 
but it could lead to problems, to errors. So code duplication is one of the things that we want to remove as much as possible. We want to, you know, gather all the code as duplicated and uh, eliminate any redundancy, having only uh, one piece of code. So what this is what we can do with the OR operator, because these are two Boolean statements. And you know what? I'm going to put them in two separate variables to make things even more clear. So let born in the future is equal to the statement year greater than 2021. Okay? And this statement can be put here, born in the future. Don't worry, I'm stopping so you can uh, copy. Okay, I'm just uh, taking some statements and uh, storing them in some variables to make things easier to read. But, and it's a waste of memory. Um, it is a waste of memory to, to write uh, all these variables. Uh, yes, probably yes, but I'm pretty sure that compilers nowadays and even the JavaScript interpreter are really able to optimize our code. And if they see that this variable is a local variable in this file, they just uh, replace this variable in every occurrence and um, it, it will be fast. Uh, we don't... We high-level developers, not you, Magikaros. You are you're doing fine in uh, uh, in doing this kind of reasoning. You probably need to uh, waste as uh, few memory as possible. You have to optimize as much as possible because you're operating on the low level. But uh, we high-level developers are pretty spoiled, and we can waste memory and uh, time because it's not that important at a high level, and uh, most of the times. Most of the time, the compiler or the interpreter will fix this uh, optimization problems that we uh, introduced. In fact, as I already said in my last stream, optimization is the root of all evil. Premature optimization is the root of all evil. Uh, this is one of the articles, but there are so many other articles there. Um, and there's also the official C2 wiki and this is a quote from Donald Knuth. Premature optimization is the root of all evil. If you try to optimize your code by reducing the amount of variables, reducing the amount of uh, calls to functions and to statements and to, uh, I don't know, to operations, etc., you are doing uh, what we've done with the, with the last thing here. What is that? I'm going to call it again. We are doing, ah, oh, what is that? This. This is optimizing. This doesn't use any variable. This does exactly what the computer is supposed to do. But this is unreadable. It's unmanageable. And we don't want to write code like this. Yes, pretty much, especially when coding for machine with very little memory, where, where every saving, every byte you can count. Exactly. And this applies also to some... Uh, to, to game engines. If you are uh, creating a game engine, you want to keep those at 60 FPS high. So usually you are doing uh, pretty, opti pretty cool optimization tricks. One optimization trick that I already showed one day was uh, how to divide a number by two with bitwise operations. So you can say 16 divided by two can be written like this. And it's a little more performant than dividing by two the usual way, way just like this but uh, in uh, our a high level coding doing this bitwise operation is nuts it has it, it has no purpose other than confusing uh, the developer's mind so no premature optimization thanks Kane Tanaka for being alive now born in the future is the result of the high uh, of asking if the year is to, is greater than 2021 in high level on modern computer is fine exactly magic ross now uh, another variable to store this result uh too old to be alive year is less than 1903 okay if the year is nine less than 1903 then i'm probably too old to be alive 
Little did you know, this variable has the same length of this other variable and I didn't do it on purpose. It's beautiful. I love it. So I'm replacing this condition here with the result of too old to be alive. And that's it. This behaves exactly the same as before. Okay. I'm going to wait a little more, giving you the time to catch up. Going so slow is not allowing me to prove you the point immediately, but who cares about that? The important thing is that you, you keep focused. Um, sometimes you're too focused in writing the code and you don't, you're not focused enough to understand the code. So it's much better if you first focus on your code and then try to understand. Or sometimes it's better if you first understand and then we write the code together. Um, we will, we will figure it out. Okay, so we've got one if that if this condition is true does one thing, and another if in the if else if statement that if another condition is true will do exactly the same as the first if was doing. This is code duplication. This is redundancy, and we want to remove the redundancy. We would like to alert year is invalid if either one of the two uh, happens either i was born in the future or i'm too old to be alive how do i do this well i put an or operation here operator here and i put those two statements in a in an or now i can completely remove this else if statement and this is the final result so I'm giving you the time to read, understand, copy, and I'm commenting. This way, I'm combining two conditions together. I'm either born in the future or I'm too old to be alive. In either case, the year is invalid. And note that I will get in this even if both conditions are true, which cannot be the case by now because either I, I was born in the future or I'm too old to be alive. I cannot be both. But one day you could probably incur into two uh, conditions that somehow overlap. Maybe, maybe we could have some situations like this. Um, well, we already said I, I could be both sitting and be happy. And if I'm sitting or happy, I want to say something. In that case, I could want to say the same thing even if I'm both sitting and happy. I don't care the fact that they are mutually exclusive. They are not, in fact. So, as you can see, the OR statement can be used to group multiple logical statements together and do some more complex reasoning. Now, thank you Kane Tanaka for helping me prove the point. And this is cool. Well, of course, the statements must be Boolean or they can be truthy. Because just like with mathematical operations that automatically convert any value into numbers, except the plus, which can be a concatenation. Well, the Boolean operators do the same thing. You can do one or zero, because one is a truthy value, which means that converting into Boolean will, will say true, and zero is a falsy value, which means that converting into Boolean it will result in a false. So, true or false is true. So, this alert will actually be executed. This one or zero works exactly like saying true or false. And as you can see, some other examples here that are really worth uh, reading. Let hour is equal to nine or some user input, of course. If the hour is less than 10 or the hour is greater than 18, then I will say the office is closed. As you can see, I'm using the or operator to join these conditions and do something with them. Uh, you can also pass more conditions. You can use the OR operator multiple times, just like you can use a plus multiple times or a minus multiple times. So you can say, hour is 12, is weekend is true. And then you can say, if hour is less than 10, or hour is greater than 18, or is the weekend, 
then you will say the office is closed. And watch out, is weekend is just a Boolean value and it doesn't care about the fact that the hour is less than 10 or greater than 18. It could be, uh, I don't know, 12 o'clock like in this case, but it's the weekend. So still the office is closed. Note that just like with the, any mathematical operator, the OR is computed from left to right. So as soon as one of these statements, of these uh, conditional statements is true, uh, the, the, the computation here will just stop. If the hour is 9, let's say, then hour is less than 18, yes, then I'm not going to calculate anything else anymore. I'm saying this because sometimes you could uh, happen to see some unexpected results. Maybe you are doing some calculations here, for example, some assignment, which I really, really discourage you to do, and the assignment is not working because the evaluation of this OR statement stopped before arriving at that operation there. Okay, so that's another reason why you should never perform calculations and especially assignments inside of a Boolean uh, predicate like this one in a Boolean statement. Just do comparisons and mix those comparisons with this new operations that I'm giving you, the OR, the AND and the NOT. Of course, in, the, in this moment, we're just seeing the OR. Oh, or finds the first truthy value. This is exactly what I was to, telling you. So if you have multiple values or conditions, it will evaluate the operands from left to right. So if this is true, it will stop there and it will not continue further in checking the truthiness of these other conditions because that's how the OR works. So as you can see, one or zero will tell me one. It's not true, it's one. This is pretty strange because if the result is between values, it's actually going to say, it's actually going to return you with the result. This result is truthy, so as a Boolean it becomes true, but the result of this statement is still the original value. So one or zero is not giving you true, it's giving you one. One is truthy, so it's true, which means that this OR statement is actually true. But since this is true, it's just going to give you immediately the result of this one. Uh, the same goes with these ones here, null or one. Null is falsy, so it will continue evaluating this expression. It finds one, which is truthy, so it will return the value one. The same goes here, null or zero or one. Null is falsy, so we go to the second part of this operation. Zero is also falsy, so we're going to another uh, part of the operation. One is truthy, I'm going to return one. And the same goes with uh, this, but these are all falsy, so it's going to return the last value, which is zero, because it's evaluating every single step of this conditional statement. Um, magic Ross, now if the variable in the future and told were constant, not the case if we want to update the code later to not be relevant later, we could eventually drop the use of variable. Hmm, not really sure what you mean. In this case, the problem is not the variable is itself. The problem is that we have to find a way to tell the computer which year is it now because if the year is greater than the current year, then we are in the future. So the problem is that we, don't, we cannot hard code 2021, because in 2022, this 2021 is not, um, is not worthy anymore. We have to change it into 2022. So we need a way to say whatever the current year is right now. And there is a way, of course, but it's a complicated way that you, uh, you beginners cannot understand. It's something like new date get full year. This will give you the current year, but uh, it's not really important to say it now. By the way, in the first example with the closed office, wouldn't be is the weekend, shouldn't be first since anyways, if it's the weekend, it's the closed no matter what hour. Uh, yeah, okay, so this is a good question. Let's have a look at this code here. 
I'm going to put it, uh, I don't know, here. Let hour is equal to 12. Let is weekend is equal to true. And then I'm checking if the hour is less than 10. If it's not, and it's not, I'm checking if the hour is greater than 18, and it's not. And finally, I'm checking if it's, a we it's the weekend. Magica Ross is uh, thinking with the optimization in mind, and I, I completely... I totally get you. I'm also like that. In fact, sometimes I do it myself and I would change this code as Magica Ross is, uh, is suggesting. If it's the weekend, I don't really care if the hour is less than 10 or greater than 18. So one thing that we could do, and it's the thing that Magica Ross is suggesting, is to place is weekend before everything else. This way, if it's the weekend, I don't even need to check if the hour is less than 18 or greater than uh, less than 10 or greater than 18. If it's the weekend, I'm done. I'm just going to alert the office is closed. If it's not the weekend, then I'm going to see at least if the hour is compatible with office hours. So this is a very simple optimization that is just changing the order of uh, the conditions to make the code a little more performant. Uh, I wouldn't do it for performance. I would, it, I would do it for readability. Um, if this is a readable, readable enough, that's fine. If it's uh, not readable enough, you can make it even more explicit. For example, you can say, if it's the weekend, then you can say the office is closed. Otherwise, if the hour is less than 10 or greater than 18, you will still say the office is closed. I don't like this code because this code is, uh, um, as you can see, duplicating code. And I don't want duplication. I want to avoid duplication. But this code could be still good if we want to say, I don't know, two different messages, for example. The office is closed for the weekend. And the other one says the office is closed outside of office hours. I'm giving a reason to have two separate ifs. If I want to give a different message, if it's the weekend or if the hours are incompatible, and in that case, it is, uh, it is good and it's uh, relevant to use two ifs. Otherwise, uh, you can mix everything in the same if. And yes, for uh, readability reasons and also for probably performance reasons, we can put the is weekend at first. The reason why this code is not doing it, it's probably because it's trying to show you this important fact. The fact that the code will stop as soon as one of the condition is true in the or statement. In other statements, it's not going to do like that. But in this kind of statement, the OR statements, as soon as you find a truthy condition, it will immediately return the first value, the first true value, truthy value, okay? Um, so you can do pretty cool things with the OR statement, even outside of conditions. So look at this. Let first name is equal to empty string. Let last name is equal to empty string. Let nickname is equal to super coder. I don't know if the user uh, set up his first name or his last name or just a nickname, but I can write something like alert first name or last name or nickname or anonymous. If I do this, this is not a Boolean condition. Well, this is a Boolean statement, but I'm, uh, uh, I'm uh, taking advantage of the fact of how the or statement works in order to say if first name is truthy, I will definitely print first name. But first name is empty, so it's falsy. So I will try with last name. Is last name truthy? No, still an empty string. Okay, so let's go to another step. Is nickname truthy? Yes, because it's not an empty string. So I will stop here and return supercoder instead of going forward and going with anonymous. If all the variables are falsy, as it says here, if the supercoder, uh, if the nickname is an empty string, then this is falsy, this is falsy, this is falsy, this is truthy, so anonymous will be returned. Okay? 
So this is a pretty strange way to use uh, conditional operators and the OR statements, but it's used quite a lot, uh, especially in scripting languages, because you can uh, use this thing of uh, having uh, truthy and uh, falsy things. Um, Angelo, sorry, another question to the weekend code. If you do not declare the variable weekend before, I guess it is considered false and the condition is not satisfied. Beautiful question. Thanks. Really, really, really beautiful question. So you're saying you're not defining the weekend. What happens here? Well, in uh, non-strict JavaScript, is weekend has never been declared, but it's not a huge problem for JavaScript, if I remember correctly. Uh, if it's not declared, it will probably be declared as an undefined variable. But let's find out. Nope. Actually, is weekend was never defined, so it's uh, it's going to give you an error. But you can define is weekend and not give a value. So you define the the, the the variable, but its value will be undefined because if you declare a variable without giving a value, let is weekend. The value of weekend is undefined. What happens in this case? Well, if undefined undefined will be converted into a boolean and undefined converted into a boolean is a falsy value will be will be false so it will this condition will not be satisfied and we will go into this part of the of the code let's find out let's try well first of all is it true that boolean of undefined is false yes it is okay so in this case is weakened is undefined it will be converted to boolean but it's false, so I'm not going into the if, I'm going into the else. It didn't do anything, and it didn't do anything because since hour is 12, this condition is false, and this condition is false too, because I'm right in the middle of office hours, so it's going to not do anything, it's not going to alert anything, because it's not getting inside of any of these blocks. But I can do another block here if I want to. Um, okay, alert. Work! And I'm probably going to have an error because the variables were already declared. No, it's saying work. I don't know why it's, it, it worked this, this time. Okay, so it says work. So it's not the weekend because the weekend is undefined, so it's falsy. It, this condition is not satisfied because our is in between of 10 and 18 and so I'm going to do work to alert work uh, Hope this answered your question. Let's go back to the weekend because it's the weekend um, Okay, so this this uh, thing that we can do which is kind of strange but can be used in uh, very convenient ways It's uh, it's one of those hack like putting the plus in front of the prompt it's uh, one thing that is a little hacky, but it's pretty uh, used and uh, it has become literature. Short circuit evaluation. Another feature of OR is the so-called short circuit evaluation. It means that the OR processes its arguments until the first truthy value is reached, and then the value is returned immediately without even touching the other argument. I think this is really similar to what we already said. True OR alert not printed. If this statement is true, then the OR is already true, and anything else after will not be evaluated. So if you try to run this, the alert will never be executed because the OR was true already evaluating the left-hand side of this, uh, of this um, statement. Otherwise, false or alert printed, well, since false, well, is false, in order to see if this or statement is true, I have to inspect also the value of the rightmost operand. And uh, it's going to print this. Alert, as we saw, is a function that returns undefined. But who cares about that? Uh, it's a falsy value, but still, it will be evaluated just like we saw here. Undefined or null or zero. All three values are falsy. So uh, when JavaScript evaluates this, um, it's going to say, this is falsy, let's jump to the second part. This is also falsy, let's jump to the third part. This is falsy, but I am at the end of this uh, statement 
and so I'm going to return whatever is this value here. Okay, so we've got still one hour, so let's go to the end. Of course, you can have the OR or you can have the AND. The AND is done with the double ampersand. And don't do a single ampersand because the single ampersand is a bitwise operator that we don't want to mess up with. So, new file, AND, JS. The AND uh, could have some truth tables. Let's do some truth tables about the AND. How does the AND work? Well, this has no surprises at all. And B. So, as always, we can have all the possible combinations. We can have A, which is true, and B, which is true. We can have A, which is true, but B is false. We can have A, which is false, but B is true. And we can have both of them false. These are the possible combinations. What happens if I combine these two statements in an end? Well, no real surprises here. If A and B are both true, A and B is true. In any other case, it will be false. If A is true and B is false, well, they are not both true, so this is false. And the same goes with uh, A false but B true. And of course it will be very false that A and B are true if both the statements are false. I see what you did there. I don't. <laughs> I say so many stupid things that I really don't remember what I did. <laughs> what are you referring to? My God, my, 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 my mind is plenty with, uh, with things that I, sometimes I completely wipe out from my RAM in my brain what I did a while ago and I fill my memory with other things. <laughs> when you said because it is the weekend. Oh, okay, yeah, <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> Okay, so the end is pretty normal, it's pretty basic, and I think you can uh, really uh, easily understand it. True and true is true. False and true is false, because one of the statements is not true. So it's not true that both of the statements are true, and the same goes with all the others. An example with the if, let hour is 12, let minute is 30. If hour is 12 and minute is 30, the time is 12.30. So you can combine these two in an end to see if both conditions are true. Not if either condition is true, but if both are true. And in this case, spoiler alert, when you have an end, JavaScript will always, always uh, evaluate both expressions. Because in order to check if all the expression is true, I need to see if this and also this are true. So these two straight statements will be both evaluated. One after the other, but still, they will be evaluated at once. So, if 1 and 0, 1 and 0 is false, because these are converted into boolean, 1 is truthy, 0 is falsy, what, true and false is false. So, alert won't work because the result is falsy. The alert will never be executed. You can perform an end with multiple uh, uh, conditions, of course, with multiple uh, boolean statements. And uh, what else, what else? And you can do an end with values that are not strictly Boolean. If you do a one and zero, what happens is that one is truthy, but still, in order to see if the whole statement is true, I have to check also the rightmost uh, hand of the operation. Zero is falsy, so the statement is false, but I'm still returning whatever was the last value that I, that, that I had to inspect. 1 and 5. 1 is truthy, so let's have a look at the 5. 5 is also truthy, and I'm still going to return the, the latest um, value that I see in this expression. You see the difference with, the, with your? Uh, let's find out again. 1 or 0 will give me 1. Oh, we've got an error. Angelo, thanks a lot for the error. Uh, I'm getting an error from Visual Studio Code, but I don't know why the truth and false code lines are triggering the error. I followed your example, Anthony, at least I hope so. Uh, yes, you did. But <laughs> the, the file, you called the file truthtable.js. And I did too. Okay. 
You know what? The problem is that uh, I'm. Uh, this is not real JavaScript code. This is bad JavaScript code. This is not working JavaScript code. So you shouldn't worry too much about these errors because this is code that is not supposed to work. If you want to remove those errors, I don't know why you got these errors and I don't. Probably because you have some uh, TypeScript validator. This is something that I would suggest all you guys to do. I recommend to do it. Uh, Tiago had a similar problem with an unrelated thing. But uh, if you do command comma or control comma, it opens the settings of Visual Studio Code. And there was a setting which was something like TypeScript validate. No, I have them uh, all enabled. That's strange. So it's not like that. Let's see JavaScript validate. Ooh, that's it. If you type JavaScript validate in the settings, the settings can be opened with command uh, comma in, on Mac or control comma on other operating systems such as Windows or Linux. And once you've got the settings, the settings are too many, so you have to filter them out. In this search text, you can write JavaScript validate, and this will filter all the settings until you find this setting here, which is enabling or disabling JavaScript validation. You don't want Visual Studio Code to validate your JavaScript. So if you had it enabled, please disable it. Because if you have it enabled, this is what you get. Errors everywhere. If you don't have it enabled, you remove all these errors. It is good to have someone to validate your code and to make it less error prone. That's why at a certain point, I will show you one important tool, which is called ESLint. And you can see the name here um, on the bottom right. So I have it installed already, but I switched it off because I don't want this automatic validation to be performed now. I want you guys to incur in mistakes without anyone pointing at you, hey, this could be a mistake. No, you have to find those mistakes uh, by yourselves. Then as soon as you really, really understood everything, then we can get the help of these tools such as ESLint to make fewer mistakes. But right now, I want you to perform lots of mistakes. It worked, Angelo. Nice. Thanks a lot. Thank, thanks you. Thanks, thank you. <laughs> okay. So we're talking about the end and the difference between the end and the or. And the difference is with the evaluation of the expression. The or is true if any of these two operands is true. So as soon as I see that the first operand is true, I can stop there. I don't need to evaluate anything else. So the result of one or zero is one because one is truthy and, I'll and I'm will i going to get the one immediately. Instead, with the end, I have to check if both operands are true in order to say that the end statement is true. That's why this is true, but I also need to check the other hand. And this is not true, but I don't care. I'm going to return the last value I was inspecting. It goes exactly the opposite way if we uh, switch the operands. If I say zero or one, then the or statement will say zero is falsy. So in order to check if the whole statement is truthy, I also have to see the other operand. The other operand is truthy, but I don't care about that. I'm still just returning the value, whatever it is. And the same goes with zero and one. I'm uh, switching um, sides of these two operands. Zero and one gives me zero because zero is falsy. And so the end of a falsy value and whatever I have on the other side is still falsy. I can stop here and return the value right away. Probably it's pretty strange for you if you never saw this before, but don't worry, we can do some exercises. We can reason a lot on these things and you will see that uh, uh, it makes a lot of sense. Um, you just have to think like a computer thinks, which is a uh, very logically 
And it, here we are going a little away from common sense, especially if you have this conception of the or to be mutually exclusive. This is not a mutually exclusive or. So watch out for that. So these are real examples that uh, you, we, can we can see together next time, maybe next Wednesday. I don't think we should uh, see all of them one by one. Um, one and two and null and three will give us null. Why is that? Because one is truthy, but all these statements should be true. Uh, sorry, all the, um, all the operands in this statement should be true in order to have all this statement to be true. So this is truthy. Okay, step aside. This is truthy. Step aside. Ooh, this is falsy. So I'm stop here and I'll return null. And I'm not going to inspect this last value. I don't care about that. And here, one is truthy. Step aside. Two is truthy. Three, three is truthy. I'm going to give you this last uh, number that I was inspecting. There is a precedence between and and or. And has a higher precedence over or. Why is that? Because this is how a uh, Boolean algebra works. And if you want to make sense of it, we can try to see the comparison between these Boolean logics and numbers. And let's see what happens. A and B in the truth table could be numbers. Uh, I wouldn't say they are numbers, but if we reason with numbers, we can say that A is 1 and B is 1. A is 1 and B is 0. A is 0 and B is 1. Actually, we could put anything, not just 1, anything that is not 0. And finally, A is 1 and B is, is, uh, A is 0 and B is 0. These are all the possible values if these two numbers were binary, either 0 or 1. And then we've got a truth table that if we don't know the operation between A and B, results in this true 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 false if true is one then i would say this is one then another one another one and then a zero <coughs> oops what is the operation in oops what is the operation in maths that results in this result one mm, one is one one mm, zero is one 0, 1 is 1, and 0, 0 is 0. What is the operation that we can have here? <clears throat> Try to guess. I hope this makes sense to you. Let's see if you can guess what is the operation that yields this result between two numbers. Yeah, the OR between Boolean values. Uh, but these are numbers. They are not, um, they are not the, the Booleans anymore. So there's no actual operation. I'm sorry, this was a tricky question. You could say it looks a lot like a plus between two numbers because 0 plus 0 is 0. 0 plus 1 is 1, 1 plus 0 is 1, and 1 plus 1 is not 1, it's actually 2. Or in binary, we can say it's a 1, 0, but it's not 1. That's why we deal with Boolean logic, which is slightly different from the usual maths that we have. Uh, it is slightly different, but behaves a lot like the ordinary math uh, with numbers that we know. Um, you're saying algebra. Yes, um, Boolean algebra, Boolean logic. Yeah, Boolean algebra. Um, so this looks a little like, um, oops, this looks a little like a plus. It's not exactly a plus, but uh, if we say that one plus one is two and uh, two is a value greater or, com or different from zero, well, then this actually equals the same operations that the, the same operation that an or would do on a Boolean. So we can say that the OR behaves a lot like just an ordinary sum between numbers. This can be converted into the Boolean true because two is greater, is different from zero, so it's true. One is also true. Uh, this one is also true. 
and zero gets converted into false. So we get this, if we convert these numbers into booleans, we got exactly the same results that we would have with, a, with an or. Let's do the same trick with, uh, with the end. If we treat these uh, values not as uh, boolean values but as numbers so we've got one and one uh, one and zero zero and one zero and zero and here we've got a and some operations between a and b we can probably convert these true and false into ones and zeros so we've got one one and three zeros one oops again zero zero and zero what is the operation between a and b that results in this truth table with numbers not with the uh, not with um, boolean values one one is one one zero is zero zero one is zero 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 is zero that looks like multiplication says bobby and I think you're totally right. One times one is one, but anytime you've got a zero, you get zero because anything multiplied by zero is a zero. This, oh, the equals. Um, oh, this is also true. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, yeah, it's multiplication. Um, or you could say is equal is one equal to one yes is one equal to no to zero no so it could be also some equality it could also seem like something like that but still this is a boolean operation instead a mathematical operation is something like summing multiplying dividing subtracting and this looks a lot like a multiplication um, so this is true this is false this is false and this is false. So there is some correlation between Boolean algebra and uh, math algebra. And the correlation is that the OR looks a lot like a sum. Not exactly, but it looks a lot like a sum. And the AND looks a lot like a multiplication when you're dealing with numbers. I want to refer to Bobby's answer, but Magic Ross slipped in between. Lol. <laughs> okay. <laughs> awesome. Um... Why am I saying this? Because this will hopefully make a lot more sense with the precedence of operators. Just like the multiplication has higher precedence over the sum, the AND has a higher precedence over the OR. Because it's like multiplication over sum. I usually call I usually see it like that. And you can do really, really complex conditional operators such as A and B or C and D. And this has an implicit couple of parentheses. So you don't need to put parentheses like here because A and B has already higher precedence than this OR. Uh, when JavaScript uh, evaluates this expression, it evaluates A and B. And if it's true, it will see that this is an OR. So we will probably stop here. But if it's a false, it will also going to go with uh, C and D. It will, it will perform this C and D and see if this is true. So, and will be performed before any or, unless I give parentheses, of course. So, A and B or C and D, I'm um, going to put it here. A and B or C and D makes no mistakes. I'm going to do A and B, I'm going to do C and D, and then I'm going to do whatever comes out from here or whatever comes out from here, which is the same as putting parentheses, which is very, very similar to do the same with, uh, with numerical algebra. If you see something like this, I hope that you already know that you have to perform the multiplications before doing any sum, unless you are putting parentheses. The parentheses are meant to uh, force some precedence. So in this case, you're going to multiply A with whatever comes from B plus C. And then whatever comes from this multiplication will be multiplied to D. And the same thing you can do in Boolean algebra. You can remove these parentheses, of course, but you can put a couple of parentheses here to force the OR of B and C 
before even doing the ends. Okay, I hope this makes sense. Um, some of you were scared that I would speak too mathematically, but yeah, probably this is the most mathematical I can get. Uh, don't replace if with or and and. This is a cool warning. Sometimes people use the and operators as a shorter way to write if. Because as soon as you got some tools, you can find some strategies and you can find very creative strategies to do what you want. For example, you can use an and operator in order to avoid an if statement. Look at that. Let x is equal to 1 x greater than zero and alert greater than zero. This results exactly like an if statement, because if x is greater than one, the end operator forces JavaScript to also evaluate the second part of the, uh, of the statement, so it's going to alert greater than zero. But if this statement is false, then the end operator will stop there, because an end between a false and anything else will still be false so i'm not i don't need to go forward and inspecting this other hand of the operation so you can use the end instead of the if but that doesn't mean you should the action in the right part of the end would execute only if the evaluation reaches it that is only if x greater than zero is true so we basically have an analog for if x is greater than zero alert then alert greater than zero although the variant with end appears shorter if is sorry Although, uh, no, there's an extra comma here, we have to adjust it. Although the variant with and appears shorter, if is more obvious and tends to be a little bit more readable. So we recommend using every construct for its purpose. Use if if we want if and use and if we want and. I hope this makes sense to you. It's really important not to abuse of the tools that you have. You can write really smart pieces of code and really obscure pieces of code. When they are obscure, you're not proving you're smart. You're actually improving your... Uh, I, uh, I don't know what to say. You're a douche. <laughs> uh, or probably douche is a bad word. I'm sorry. I don't want to, to, to say a bad word. I think that's even more complicated than plain if else. Yes, it is complicated. Exactly. Uh, but sometimes I see things like this. I even see combination with or. And I must confess, sometimes I do it. I shouldn't, but I use the or in order to log something in the console, but uh, continue with the, uh, with the execution of a program. Uh, but as soon as I do that thing with an OR, it's just for debugging and I remove everything. Finally, this is the last operator, which doesn't mean that it's over yet, but still. The last operator is a unary operator because it's uh, on one only, one operand only. It's the exclamation sign and it's called the not. The not operator negates whatever expression you have. So result is not value. And if you say alert not true, this means false. Alert not zero means true, because zero in front of this uh, Boolean operator must be evaluated as a Boolean. So it's converted into a false and not false is true. This results in very creative uh, ways to convert things into boolean and i already gave you a sneak peek on this if you put not not a double negation on uh, some value this will strangely enough convert the value into a boolean in fact a non-empty string if you negate it it will become true and if you negate it again it will become false so why is it saying that it's true oh uh, sorry sorry no, a non-empty string, if you turn it into a boolean, will be true. And I'm turning it to a boolean because I'm negating it. So a truthy value negated will be false. And if I negate it again, it's now true. So the not not with this double negation forces the value to become a boolean by negating the boolean and renegating it again. So it becomes the initial value, but boolean. Really, really strange. I like it because I can say not not, which is fun to say, but I wouldn't recommend to convert anything into a boolean with the not not operator. If you have a non-empty string, 
we already saw that it's much better to convert it into a boolean using boolean of non-empty string but if you want to look like a smart ass then you can negate non-empty string which is giving you false and then negate this again which will give you the original boolean value of the non-empty string okay pretty strange but of course the not not is not intended to be used like that the not operator is not intended to be used like that oh they say exactly the same thing as i'm saying you see boolean non-empty string gives you exactly the same result and it doesn't look like magic it looks like an explicit conversion of a string into a boolean and that's it for the tutorial here but that's not for me because it's not enough i want to do a little more with the not Magic Ross says, if it's obscure, you're probably doing things you don't want other people to understand. Yes, and you know what? This tutorial, I love this tutorial, this uh, javascript.info, because it also has a whole section, uh, where are the, a whole section about code quality and a whole section about ninja code, which is a beautiful, ironic uh, page that uh, is uh, talking about people that wants they want to make their code obscure because this way they feel smarter than everybody else and we're going to do this uh, this part of the tutorial uh, one of in the in the near future so bear with me we're going to talk about those smart asses and we're going to put them back on track so what can you do with negation well pretty basic things probably you probably uh, uh, understood what you can do but uh, not js let is gen z is equal to uh, year is greater than 2000 not true but for our purposes it is let's also define the year let year is equal to i don't know let 1982 i'm stopping here so everybody can uh, write along I could write the prompt, but I don't feel like it right now. It's uh, that's uh, just noise. I want to stick with the uh, things that we already know. So let year is 1982 or whatever year you want. Is Gen Z is equal to year greater than 2000? Let's go back to Bobby's uh, uh, to Bobby's attempts because I, as I said, they are really, really important. They are really, really useful. For example, he created a variable that was similar to this is Gen Z, but also a variable that was is not Gen Z, a variable that stated exactly the contrary. And what uh, Bobby did was saying that year is uh, less than or equal 2000, which is true. I'm Gen Z if the year is 2000 and I'm not Gen Z if the year is less than or equal to 2000 But this looks a lot like duplication of code Well, it's not real duplication because there's a different operator But it says exactly the opposite of what this statement says. So instead of doing this I can also use an alternative form using the not operator uh, I'm commenting out this thing. I can say not is Gen Z I'm negating the statement above and this has exactly the same meaning so I don't need to perform any other calculations I can just negate what I had before okay so this is pretty convenient and I can also do something like um, sometimes for some reason I need to do uh, I really don't know. I have, I have no idea how to make it uh, easy. Uh, I want to check if uh, my variable is undefined or not. Let my variable. My variable is could be undefined, could be null. I could check if the variable is not. Um, I could check if the variable is not null or undefined. And in that case, I will print the value of this variable otherwise I would say no this variable is not learned defined and I don't like it okay something like that is it important to not have a space between not and the variable value okay so the question is as always really on point is there a reason to not put a space in here 
Mm, there's no real reason to not put a space in here, but usually with unary operators, with unary operators, we prefer to have the unary operator as close as possible to its operand. Just like we say let num is equal to two, we want to say minus num close to the variable. I could do minus space num, but it looks like a subtraction in which something is missing. And there is something missing. Oh, keeps buffering. I'm sorry for that, guys. I uh, don't really know what to do. I'm going to close Slack. And... Uh, nope, there's not much to do other than uh, just to re... Oh, keeps... Oh, it's just for Catry, for Opera, maybe. By the way, if you want to be a smart ass, he's in low-level coding. Intel Move Instruction is Turing complete. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to go that way. But um, yeah, that's awesome. Uh, you know what? Um, probably, I don't know how many of you people know, but HTML and CSS have always been considered not a programming language. They are a markup language. They are a styling language. And uh, they are not a programming language because real programming languages have ifs and loops and other fancy things that HTML and CSS do not have. But... Starting from HTML5 and CSS3, we started having variables, we started being able to, to do other things, like even loops. And uh, speaking of Turing complete, since Magica Ross uh, mentioned it, HTML5 plus CSS3 is now Turing complete. So it could be considered the both, both languages together, could be considered a real programming language. Not for the purists, but it's actually like that. Let's see if I can find some information about that. Breaking news! This was already breaking news in 2011. A programming language is Turing complete if it is equivalent to a Turing machine. In practice, it means that any algorithm can be implemented. I'm not talking about. I'm not going to talk about Turing machines because it's not worth it. But uh, yeah, this is theor um, theoretical computer science. We had to do it at university. It's really, really interesting, but it's not useful for our purposes. But if uh, a language is Turing complete, it means that it can do anything that a machine is able to do, let's say like that. And apparently HTML plus CSS3 is now also Turing complete because it can be used to program this kind of, uh, um, this kind of program, which is the prototype of any program that you can write. So yeah, uh, whenever you say people looking down on you that, and saying, hey, you're an HTML and CSS developer, that's not a real programming language, you can say, you know what? Actually, HTML5 plus CSS3 is a programming language because it's Turing complete. Suck it. Okay, let's go back to business. So I was saying, let my variable, my variable could be undefined, could be null, could be not null and not undefined. In that case, I want to print the value of that variable. Uh, otherwise, I don't know. Let's see. Uh, if something happens here, I want to print the value of my variable, like uh, alert my variable. What is this uh, thing that should happen? Of course, this is uh, only a placeholder. It's not real code. I'm going to say if the variable is uh, not undefined and then the variable is not null. So if it's not undefined and it's not null, it means that it has a value. Uh, maybe I can even put it on a separate variable so it's, uh, it's uh, more clear. Let has a value. Let has a value is a variable that I'm going to use in this if statement, has a value. And how do I calculate if this variable has a value? I can say that my variable is not undefined but I also want to check if this variable is not null and I can do this because when I say and it translates automatically into an and my variable 
is not null. That's it. I now know that my variable has a value because it's not undefined and it's not null also. The tricky part of Boolean algebra is that it, there is a huge difference between the AND and the OR. And a good exercise could be always reasoning about what if I changed this AND into an OR? What would the meaning become? For example, here I'm saying my variable should be undefined, but it's not enough. I also want to check if my variable is not null. If I instead replace this with an OR, this means that my variable should not be undefined. And if it's not undefined, I'm already fine. It's, I can stop here and I'm going to print the value of this variable because the variable is not undefined. But the variable could still be null. And I never evaluated this expression because this part of the expression was already true. So this OR has a completely different meaning. It could seem like good code here because a, va a variable has a value if it's not undefined or if it's not null. So I said OR. I should put OR here? No. The real logic, the computer logic, which, is, which should be also our logic, is a, val a variable has a value it, not if it's, if it's not undefined or if it's not null, but if it's both not undefined and not null. You see how, how subtle this difference is? Please, during this, uh, this week, try to reason on these things. And please don't get crazy. Most of the mathematicians, especially the people that deal with logics that I know about, uh, got mad, got crazy as horses at a certain point in their life. So watch out, because this is dangerous. But um, it's, it's still pretty important. Okay, so this is a good statement. Uh, my variable has a value if it's not undefined and also if it's not null. Let's try. Let's try. My variable is currently undefined because I never gave it a value. So let's see what happens. Has a value is not defined because I misspelled. You see, has a value is not defined at line three. Uh, this one should be a column one, I think. So there is an error and it's uh, pretty uh, clearly stated. I can open also the stack trace, which I don't care about. Has a vowel is not defined on line three. Let me check line three, which is not line three here because I have other things here. But uh, this is line three of my five lines code and if in fact i have um a typo here so value let's try again i usually don't do typos i do typos when i'm under pressure and i should do more typos because they are really really important let's see undefined my variable was undefined so this statement was false because my variable was not undefined False. It, it was undefined. And my variable was uh, different from null. Uh, that's true, but I don't care because this was already false. And uh, this if so is false and it's not alerting anything. Let's try again. I hate these messages. Variable is equal to null this time. If variable is equal to null, then the variable is different from undefined. So this statement is true. So I have to get to, to inspect the second part of this end and variable is not different from null. In fact, it's actually equal to null. So this if is false, so it's not going to alert anything. And exactly how, exactly as expected. Finally, I'm going to put a value here. Finally. The variable is different from undefined, true. The variable is also different from null, true. So finally, this statement has a value, is true, and it's going to alert the value of my variable. Finally. Okay, this is one of the examples with the end. Why did I show, why did I show you this example? 
The reason is that now we can play around with this, with this conditional statement. We can try to arrange this statement in different ways that are completely equivalent one with another. Just to, to play. Everything good so far? Let's see if you have anything for me, any feedback, negative, positive feedback. Negative feedback is always positive because it gives me a chance to improve. I want to be, I want this academy to be the most effective possible to you. I want you to be happy with this academy and I want to spread the word also because maybe you can, you know of anybody who could benefit from this academy. Okay, all good so far, says Bobby. Good. So, um, let's define let has a value some other way. Oh, I got one. So, if you just write the variable in the if condition, it just check if the variable is true. Yes, exactly. And, oh, as always, <laughs> this is a good question. Yes, has a value is a variable that now holds a Boolean value. So, it's either true or false. I saw people doing something like this. And doing this is not a problem. You can check if the variable has a value which is equal to true. But as we saw the, already a couple of hours ago, this is quite redundant. This is, if has a value is equal to true, this is just like saying is true equal to true, or if has a value is false, it's exactly like saying is false equal to false. So it's not really that important to, to write this has a value equals to true. This is a Boolean condition. A Boolean condition is either true or false, but has a value is already a Boolean and it can be used as a Boolean condition already. So we don't need to put this. Okay, so yes, exactly. Angelo, um, this variable is already, uh, is an expression, an expression that gives you a result, a value of true and false. So it can be a Boolean condition. You can even put other things that are not boolean. You can say one. If one will always be true, because one will be automatically converted into a boolean since it's a truthy value. So this is a valid condition. If zero, on the other hand, will be a falsy condition. You can say if zero is equal to false, not strictly, because they are different types. But e zero is equal to false. But still, again, this is redundant because zero itself, when converting it to a boolean, is already false. So I can just type it like this. Okay, so has a value can be defined this way. Can we also define it in other ways? Is it convenient to define it in other ways? Probably not. I will show you a couple of things. So let's comment out this has a value and I'm going to redefine it in a different way. One thing that we can do is to do some algebra. And you know what? I already uh, told you about the truth table of the or and the and. I should probably show you the truth table of the not. The truth table of the not is really, really, really basic. In fact, uh, since it's a unitary, unary operator, uh, we just apply it to one variable. The variable can be either true or it can be false and there's no other combinations. We've just got A and A is true or false. When you add another variable like B, the number of combinations double. And if you put another variable C, the number of combinations will rise exponentially. We will have two to the power of three combinations, eight combinations a, for A, B and C. But for A, it's really, really basic. So for A, not A means that if A was true, not A is false. Ah, And if A was false, not A is true. That's it. Really, really, really basic. What if we had to deal with numbers, as always? If a was 1 and if a was 0, what happens to not a? I saw that Angelo is uh, actually typing all this truth table with me, so I'm, uh, I'm slowing down. 
I'm sorry, I'm saying not A. I want to say, uh, I know what is not A. Not A is false, which in numbers could be called zero. And not A is true, which in numbers could be one. So the question is, what is the operation that I should apply to A in order to have this situation? And uh, this is a really tough question, actually. The, the, the question is tough also because the first answer that could come to my mind is, well, probably the not is like a negation. But it's not. If I try to negate the number, just like minus number, one negated will be minus one, and zero negated will be zero. So this is not a numerical negation. Negating a Boolean value is not the same as negating a number. It's a different kind of operation, and it's a strange one. And if I remember correctly, uh, it's, it's probably way too tricky for you to guess right on the spot. So I'm going to tell you, uh, unless you say, no, 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 I want to guess. But the operation is, drum roll, gonna say it, 1 minus A. 1 minus A works. In fact, if A is 1, 1 minus 1 is 0. And if A is 0, 1 minus 0 is 1. So it's not just a simple operation here. I have to perform a computation, and the computation is this one, 1 minus A. So as you can see, Boolean algebra is not exactly the same as normal numeric algebra. They are slightly different, and it's intended to be like that. Okay, but th this is just out of curiosity, of course. Okay, so now that we know about negation, uh, we don't really care about that, we can try to do something with these things. So, for example, my variable is different from undefined. Uh, I can call it like that, or I can say that it's not true that my variable is equal to undefined. So I can call it like this, not my variable equal to undefined. This, if you think about it, is exactly the same as this. Because if a variable is not something, then it is not true that the variable is equal to that something. I just flipped the logic here. Let's do the same for the other part. My variable is different from null, so that means that it's not true that my variable is equal to null. Oop, triple equals. I want to be as precise as possible. Okay. And there's one last thing that I want to show you about uh, Boolean algebra because I think it could be important in the future if you, if you have to program some uh, complex logic conditions. We've got some uh, important formulas, two formulas, really, really easy. The formulas are called De Morgan, De Morgan's Law, De Morgan's Laws. Let's see if there's a cool page. Okay, yeah, we can see it like that. The laws are like uh, are as follows. Not A and B is exactly the same as saying not A or not B. And not A or B is the same saying not A and not B. As you can see, uh, there is some switching behind. If you negate this whole OR expression, it becomes an AND between the two statements negated. And the same goes uh, on the other way for this other law. If you negate an AND, it becomes an OR between the two negated statements. It is like that. I don't know how to prove it, but if you try to do some examples, it makes a lot of sense. For example, let's try with uh, happy and standing. If I'm not happy and standing, this means that I'm either not happy or not standing. If uh, I'm not 
happy or standing and this is quite tricky it means that I'm not happy and I'm not standing so if you try with practical examples it it just works De Morgan didn't uh, create these laws from scratch probably he uh, he discovered these laws from how we humans reason it just works okay so if you have in mind these laws you can use them sometimes at your advantage to make some uh, conditions a little more readable for example using de morgan's law laws you can write this like so this is a not well this is an end between two knots and an and between two knots becomes the knot of an or whoa okay but it's like that i'm going to stay it here d morgan laws the first one well i don't know if it's the first one i'm gonna say okay uh i'm stopping here and not a or b is exactly the same as saying not a and not b i'm using the javascript language this time and the other law is not a and b is exactly the same as saying not a or not b and of course you can read this on the other way around so if you have not a and not b you can transform it into a not a or b and if you have a not a or not b you can transform it grouping the two into a not of a and b so using this formula here we've got an end between two knots this becomes a not of an or so my variable is undefined or my variable is null let's try to make sense of this the first statement said that my variable has a value if it's not undefined and it's not null this makes sense the second statement says it has a value if it's not true that my variable is undefined and it's also not true that my variable is null this other statement says my variable has a value if it's not true that the value is undefined or the value is null mm, yeah it's not really that understandable but um, it has exactly the same meaning and we can try going here hoping I'm not going too fast please tell me every time I'm going too fast please tell me so if the variable is undefined this all this thing here should be equal exactly to the same logic that we uh, that, that we created before so okay it's not alerting anything because my variable is undefined let's try again with null can I do it like this or is going is it going to complain no it's gonna work okay and finally let my variable is equal to this works yep this works so these three statements are completely equivalent one to the other and uh, you decide what you like best you decide what represents best what you have in mind maybe this is way too much convoluted maybe this is more readable to you or maybe you prefer this one it depends on what you're trying to describe sometimes you prefer to do it like this sometimes you prefer to do it like that sometimes you want to mix things together you can split all this logic into different things i'm going to write a lot of code here now uh, i'm not i don't expect you guys to uh, write everything with me now because it's something that you can just uh, create and then destroy and then you can try yourself at home so i can say a boolean value is undefined is undefined means that my variable 
is undefined. Let is null is a variable that holds the value of my variable is equal to null. And now, if I want to know if uh, my variable has a value, oh, come on. I can say that the value the variable is not undefined and it's also not null this statement here is exactly the same as this one only I used some variables instead of doing all the calculations at the same time or I can use uh, this other way here using De Morgan's law laws and have uh, something like this has a value means that it's not true that is undefined or null is it not clear enough i'm going to create another variable here uh, has no value a variable has no value if it's undefined or if it's null so has a value means that it's not true that it has no value you see, this makes a little more sense now. So, let's recap. I've got a variable. Is undefined says that, var that the variable is undefined. Is null says that my variable is null. Has no value means that the variable is either undefined or it is null. And the fact that it has a value is just the negation of what I said before. It's not true that the variable has no value. It has a value. So now I can use this variable, which is the result of multiple computations here, to obtain exactly the same results. You know what? I'm going to, yeah, Let's paste here. Uh, I'm going to also to add some, uh, some comments. So if you look at my repo, or my GitHub repo, you will have these comments too. So this is really explicit. This is using De Morgan laws. De, Mo De Morgan law. Uh, this is just uh, a stupid way to just not use the not equals, but just using the equals, using strict equality. And this was our first attempt, which is fine. I, I actually prefer this one. Actually, there's one more that I prefer better than every other, uh, every other, uh, every other attempt here. So let has value. My variable is undefined. Uh, I can call this, um, I don't know, using strict inequality. Okay, this is really explicit. And now I'm going to show you one last way. Let has a value which is a way that you know already, already know which is drum roll again my variable well is different from null that's it as you can see this different is not with strict equality this is not strictly equal if you remember what i told you about type conversions there is one only uh, occasion in which I accept to not use strict equality and it's when comparing to null because when you do this non-strict equality with null you are catching both cases if the variable is null and also if the variable is undefined so this is probably the best way because it's the most concise and it doesn't even uh, use uh, any boolean operator there I would use this one unless it's unclear to myself or to any other developers in that case I would use any other form like that so as you can see boolean algebra allows you to perform calculations on the truthiness or the faultiness of statements and it's really really important especially for example in gaming because in games you have to see if the enemy is looking directly at me and if I'm at distance of a sh um, shooting range and uh, if the enemy is really, really angry at me and if any other condition applies, then 
the enemy will probably try to shoot me. Or end if there's no obstacle in between, blah, 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 blah. So there's a lot of Boolean algebra happening with video games. In fact, when you uh, hear about uh, AI in games, usually it's just a bunch of if-else uh, statements with many conditions. I don't know if I can find something like that. AI in games meme. There's lots of memes about this. Not only in games, actually. <laughs> okay, no, I can't see it. Uh, no, but uh, I see other things like AI in FPS game, AI in card games, AI in chess games. This is also quite true. AI is a very broad term. And AI, most of the times, is just a bunch of ifs. And I probably can find something like that. AI, bunch of ifs. Look at that. Mr. AI. Instead, it contains just, of if, uh, just a bunch of ifs and uh, else ifs or elif in other languages. And that's true, that's true. But, yeah, there are multiple kinds of AI in... Um, in programming and in and in gaming also if you see that a game learns from your mistakes or adapts the difficulty to your skill level then then there's some uh, a little more ai involved it could even involve some uh, neural networks some statistical um, methods there so that's probably a very evolved ai in chess games the AI developed by IBM, Deep Blue, et cetera, et cetera. Well, that's a very, very complex AI, which makes use of a lot of statistical um, calculations. Um, but you can get, out, get on with it with some uh, very stupid AI that is just a bunch of if-elses, especially for simple games. FPS, FPS games, as we saw, do not even need that much of an AI to be enjoyable. Okay, and I think that's it for today. Did I want to tell you anything more here? No, tasks, and no, that's time we're going to look at this operator here, which is a new addition that I never used before, but I'm going to mention it. And then we'll go to the big boss, loops. Let's have a look at, oh, I wanted to show you these memes. Logical operators, not false. It's funny because it's true. And with this ugly, ugly pun, I'm leaving you here. I hope you enjoyed my lesson. I see one new follower. I don't know who it is. Probably Magica Ross. Thanks for following. Uh, if you want to join Discord, please do. Let's create an awesome community of people that share things and interact, share memes, share problems, share solutions. It, I it would be lovely to see you here. Great and brain-melting lesson, says Angelo. Thanks a lot, Anthony. Ne until next week. Thank you, guys. It's such a pleasure to do a lesson with you guys. I love you. And remember, during this whole week, eat pasta, code faster. Bye.